fair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're yeah, supposed it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good morning and welcome to the show. Happy Monday morning. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. And I'm with you live from 10 until 1. Coming up in this hour, Israeli forces have largely withdrawn from southern Gaza. The move comes just six months after the Hamas attacks on October 7th as Israel and Hamas both have sent delegations to Cairo to join fresh ceasefire negotiations. Uh, meanwhile, the government is under pressure to publish the legal advice to ministers over Israel's compliance with international law as calls for a suspension of British arms exports to Israel grow. And Angela Rayner is facing fresh tax questions over her denial of claims that she may have wrongly avoided capital gains tax and broken electoral law over the sale of her council house all those years ago. The Labour deputy leader's own tweets showing her family home at the time suggest she did break the rules. All that, plenty more besides. First, though, let's get the latest news headlines with Emily Rose Adams. Good morning. Palestinians have started to return to the city of Khan Yunis after Israel withdrew almost all of its troops from southern Gaza, leading to hopes that more humanitarian aid can safely reach civilians. Officials believe the IDF has reduced its number of troops in the region so they can regroup before targeting Rafah, where hundreds of thousands are sheltering. Well, Assad Rehman from the anti-poverty charity War on Want says that would only mean more violence and more deaths. The majority of the Palestinian people in, in Gaza now have been internally displaced. They're trapped into an area smaller than the size of Heathrow Airport without food, sanitation. I think the voice is around the world quite clearly and quite rightly now are calling for an immediate ceasefire, that we have to end this violence, to end this indiscriminate killing of, of innocent Palestinian men, women and children. The UN's atomic watchdog has warned a new drone attack on Ukraine's Zaporizhia power plant raises the risk of a major nuclear accident. Russia's nuclear power corporations accused Ukraine's military of carrying out the strikes, but Ukraine denies involvement. Three people were injured and the plant's Russian-installed administration said radiation levels were normal and that no damage was caused. Here, and a major manhunt continues after a 27-year-old mum was stabbed and killed while pushing her baby in a pram in Bad Bradford. Police say Habiba Masum is wanted over the attack and that he's known to the victim, but they won't confirm how. Well, former Detective Superintendent Shabnam Chowdhury has told Talk TV there will be great urgency to track him down. One day may not seem a lot of time to many people, but in the life of a murder investigation, that's a significant amount of loss of evidence and the golden hours, which are really crucial at this time. The police will be looking at CCTV, any digital footprint that he may have left behind in terms of where he's gone. Chaos continues across the rail network this morning with train drivers walking off the job in their third day of major strike action over pay and working conditions. Staff at 16 train companies are taking part, causing cancellations, delays or no service at all to some areas. And passengers who've spoken to Talk TV have mixed views. I think this could go on forever at the rate things are going. It's... Yeah, they're getting how much a year? It's, it's very difficult to say how much more they could want, really. It's about safety and stuff and their work environment, so I think they've got to do what they need to do until they get noticed, you know? It obviously causes disruption trying to commute in today. I've got an important meeting to sort of run this afternoon, so, you know, drives a bit of concern. Times are hard for everyone, I think, aren't they? So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's difficult. Boeing is under investigation after a plane part fell during takeoff yesterday in the U.S., striking a wing cap. The Southwest flight was departing from Denver with 135 passengers on board when an engine cowling detached. It managed to turn back and land safely, and it follows other manufacturing and safety concerns at Boeing. 
And a charity is calling for tanning salons to have graphic warning signs similar to those found on cigarette packets to warn customers about the dangers of using sunbeds. Skin Cancer UK says the move could save lives and is calling on the government to update legislation and make a warning signs mandatory. It's estimated there are almost 17,000 cases of melanoma in the UK each year. That's the latest. Now time for a look at today's weather with Nazneen Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello. We're still looking at rather unsettled conditions for today and, in fact, for this week. Today, it's uh, in the form of a name storm by Meteor France that is bringing wet weather across many northern and western parts of England and Wales. And later this afternoon and into tonight, there will be a bunch of showers moving northwards over central, southern and eastern areas. But for many parts of central northern Scotland, it will be mostly fine and bright. Northern Ireland, though, will see some rain through this afternoon. And overnight, the winds will strengthen down towards the southwest with gusts up to around 70 miles per hour. There is a warning from the Met Office for that. And the rain continues its journey further northwards up towards Scotland and northern England, where there is a warning for the south and east of Scotland, as there could be the risk of localised flooding from the rains there. Elsewhere, mostly dry and uh, clear with uh, rather cool conditions compared to the last few nights. But there will be lots of showers across the parts of the Midlands, central and eastern England that will continue there through tomorrow. The rain will also continue across much of Scotland, some of it turning wintry across the Highlands. And the there will be rain across parts of Wales, easing later across southern areas in the south. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good morning and welcome back to the show. I'm Julia hartley Brewer and you're with Talk TV. You knew all of that already. Uh, lots more to talk about uh, today. Uh, lots of big uh, stories in town, both at home and abroad. And joining me to run through all of the top stories is commentator Sam Armstrong. Thank you so much for joining us once again. Good morning, Julia. Always good to start on Monday morning with you. We kind of, you know, get the blood flowing and, uh, and get a bit of, uh, get some meaty topics. Um, well, I mean, no doubt at all, Israel Gaza, what's uh, at home and abroad, actually, is still one of the top stories. Six months anniversary of the horrific Hamas attack that took uh, uh, some uh, almost 1,200 lives uh, in Israel on October the 7th. Um, we also saw a couple of key developments. One, crucially, the IDF withdrawing pretty much all of their uh, troops uh, from southern Gaza, um, from Jan Kunis. Um, talk about any, any uh, assault on Rafa will be, will be long delayed. We're seeing more aid getting in, a lot more aid, which is absolutely crucial for civilians, but also, crucially, negotiators from the IDF and from Hamas meeting in Cairo, negotiations on some sort of ceasefire and hostage returns uh, starting once again. All, I mean, positive developments, would you say? I'd say no, actually. I may be the only person left in this country that actually believes that Israel has a right to go and get its hostages back. Oh, yeah, I'm with you go all the way. And pursue the murderous gangs that marauded across its country, that raped its women, that kidnapped its children, and killed its elderly. If it's just me, I will keep saying this. Hamas is a terrorist, murderous, brutal gang that persecutes its own people, that tries to murder those around it, that needs wiping off the face of the earth. This war has taken a little while, but let's be clear, six months in the grand scheme of warfare is not that long a time. I'm, the... I'm, I'm fascinated by how many people uh, in discussing this in Britain talking about how this has gone on for too long. Six months is not a long time in any warfare. If you look at Iraq, Afghanistan, look at Ukraine war stretching well into its third year now. And the number one reason why this war has taken the time it's taken and why it has been so difficult to pursue Hamas without incurring civilian casualties is that Hamas uses the people of Gaza as a national human shield to hide it, to hide its corruption, to hide its criminality from the justice that it deserves. So those appalling scenes, not oh. just in October, but that run through its entire history. We discussed this an awful lot last week, but what, what do you think about this ongoing discussion about, you know, arms sales, uh, particularly from the UK? Now, bearing in mind, it's less than sort of 
0.1% of arms sales of, of the arms that Israel has come from the UK. So it's more of a, it's, it's, a, it's an Islington dinner party principle conversation rather than it is a practical consideration of their ability to wage war against the Hamas terrorists. But uh, we had the Deputy Prime Minister, Oliver Dowden, who uh, was on Laura Kunzberg's show yesterday on the BBC. And I have to say, you know, giving very strong, very strong support to Israel, rather more than I would say that David Cameron, our Foreign Secretary, is currently giving to Israel. But he said that he believes it is still legal for the UK to continue to sell arms to Israel, despite, of course, former Supreme Court judges uh, and some other 600 great legal minds of the great and the good saying that we should suspend sales, uh, arms sales to Israel. Now, this has happened under numerous prime ministers before, including General Margaret Thatcher and Tony Blair. This does happen depending on what Israel is doing. Do you think it is still legitimate for us to, under our rules at home and international law, to supply arms to Israel? Yeah, I'm sorry, Baroness Hale of Brexit, spider, brooch fame, but I think you may have missed the memo, right? Lawyers don't run this country. Our I think you'll find, <laughs> you'll find you're wrong there. Our politicians are at least supposed to be running this country and they have decided that it's entirely legitimate to sell and uh, give arms to Israel. Let's be clear, Israel sells us far more arms than we sell to Israel. Mm -hmm. And every time these uh, lefty types start campaigning on shutting down oil in the North Sea, on stopping selling arms, let's just remember that our balance of trades, the amount of money that we're sending out of this country versus how much is coming in gets worse worse and worse and worse. It's almost as if those people on the left don't like this country, want to see it decline, want to see it... Lose but hold money. on a minute. Look, I, I want a moral foreign policy. I, I, I want a foreign policy in the interests of Britain, but I also want as much as possible, because we do have to do dealings with horrible countries like Saudi Arabia, because they're better than the alternative. That's the only reason we should do business with them. However, I mean, I, I, as far as I'm concerned, Israel is an ally of ours. And when there are mistakes, like the horrific deaths of those, uh, those seven civilian um, um, you know, World Food Kitchen aid workers, um, including three Brits, absolutely awful. Were you, were you, were you sh I mean, I was quite shocked by the national outrage about this by so many people, how appalling and awful this was. Unfortunately, this does happen in war. And Britain has done it, America has done it, all of our allies have done it. Um, it's not like Israel denied it. They admitted within, you know, very, very quickly, within a day or so. It was them. They have apologised. That doesn't make it OK if you're their family member, their colleague or their friend. Of course it doesn't. However, we, we, you know, the, the understanding is they believed they were Hamas fighters. The information was wrong. It's a terrible tragedy. These things happen. I'm, I'm not saying, I'm not being glib about it. I'm just fascinated by how many people are absolutely stunned to discover that innocent people die in wars. Yeah, and let's be clear, they happen in anti-terrorist operations more. Why? Because terrorists don't wear uniforms. Yep. They don't turn up in tanks. They hide in civilian cars. They deliberately make themselves look like these people. And we know Hamas has used ambulances. Uh, the and in so doing, they, they endanger people. But you're absolutely right. These types of uh, incidents happened on operation when we were in Iraq, when we were in Afghanistan. British troops do it. Nobody called for us to be struck out of the world scene no. when it happened. It's almost as if there are certain people just looking and waiting, for ready things. for Israel to slip up such that they can... Now, you've offered support to Israel, so I do have to ask you, are you in the pay of the Israeli government or, or, or others who are requiring you to say this? Because that's the accusation I get against myself. I mean, I ended Thursday's show being accused of being not just a supporter, a facilitator, but a perpetrator of genocide, extraordinarily. I'm not smiling at the word genocide. I'm smiling at the idea that someone sitting in a TV studio is perpetrating genocide. I haven't received a penny in my life from the Israeli government, but let me tell you what I do believe in. I do believe in democracy. I do believe in human rights. Yep. I do believe in not hurling gay people off the top of buildings just because you don't like the look of them. I do believe that terrorists, wherever they are in the world, need to be hunted down, need to be destroyed, and they need to be driven off the surface of the earth. And, and Israel is doing that, and they have my backing 100% of we, the way. And we used to think that about Al-Qaeda and ISIS, but it turns out an awful lot of Brits, and that would include um, Brits of all backgrounds, Backgrounds. Don't think that about Hamas, who are a prescribed terrorist organisation. Extraordinary survey uh, commissioned uh, uh, by the Henry Jackson Society showing that, um, I mean, just extraordinary, 46% of British Muslims in this country 
back Hamas. They support Hamas. Only, no, um, only one in four of British Muslims in this country believe that Hamas committed murder and rape in Israel on October the 7th. Now, this they did actually do a comparison with a survey they'd carried out at the same time of the wider British population. Um, uh, so only 24% of uh, British Muslims believe that Hamas committed rape and murder on the 7th of October, compared to 62% of the general public. But hey, 38% of the general public, more than a third of people in this country, don't believe that murder and rape happened. They, it's just all made up. It's all a complete made up thing. This is absolutely terrifying to me. Now, it's terrifying to me that anybody thinks this, and yet we know they do. I can see from the tweets I get. But the fact that just one in four British Muslims believes this, the fact that the fact that 46% of Muslims, according to the survey, believe that they support Hamas. What, I mean, I'm asking, I'm asking our audience about this, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this. Um, they say they sympathise with Hamas. This is according to this new poll. I want to know what your reaction is to that, because this is a prescribed terrorist organisation that has not just committed crimes of absolutely abhorrent brutality, um, and taken hostages. They're open about it. It's not people saying it. They they have said, the leaders of Hamas have said, we would commit October the 7th again. We know they're holding hostages. Why are they having hostage, hostage release negotiations if they're not holding hostages? We know that women were raped and murdered. We know that children were killed. We know that bodies were burnt alive. Because it's on the Hamas body cam footage. It, they put out some of these images themselves on their own Telegram posts. So I want to know from you, what is your reaction to that? Give us a call on 0344 499 1000. Text on 8722. We'll get in touch on X at Talk TV. Calls to charge at the national rate. Text cost one standard network rate message. Um, so over to you, Sam. Um, wh what do you make of this? I want to speak carefully here, but we've spoken for a long time about a minority within the British Muslim community that hold extreme mm. views. The apparent suggestion of this poll is that extremism, that dangerous um, fact-defying beliefs around areas as sensitive as terrorism and rape as a war crime are not held, are not held by a minority. A tiny minority. A yeah. tiny minority of British Muslims. They are held by a plurality at worst. Mm. That is shocking. It is shocking to me that twice as many British Muslims deny the reality of a pogrom against Jews than believe the alternative. Mm. This is legitimising of something akin to Holocaust denial. It is running rampant within the British Muslim yep. community. This is it's running rampant on the left as well, generally. This is a national crisis. This is a disgrace. This is phenomenally dangerous. That assuming that these 38, 40% of people that, that are prepared to say out loud that they don't believe that this happened, they believe that a Jew, yeah. presumably a Jewish conspiracy, perhaps, mm -hmm. and we say... They say there are lots of other questions in this survey where they believe that a huge, huge percentage of British Muslims believe that Jews have too much influence in British politics, in British media, etc., etc. ..are controlling the media in order to tell a lie about what happened. Now, we know that that is poppycock. It is nonsense. It is balderdash. It is absolutely, categorically untrue. We have seen independent reporters go in and validate every yeah. single line item of that. And if our politicians cannot get a grip of this, well then within 10, 15 years, I believe yeah. we're really heading towards a I, very I mean, dangerous crisis. This, I do think this is really, really dangerous. We're going to talk more about that. I want to move on now. Though. I want to talk about Angela Rayner and her house sale. Now, look, we've had um, Tory MPs, um, you know, like Nadim Sahawi, I mean, having to resign, and quite rightly, uh, after basically avoiding five million pounds in tax that was due and battling with uh, HMRC. When multimillionaires are dodging tax, I think a lot of us have very strong opinions on it. Uh, we had the uh, Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister, and his wife, heiress to a billionaire's empire in India, um, claiming non-dom status, despite the fact she's here with her husband, who's Prime Minister, uh, children at school here. I mean, an absurdity, uh, and, and make gaining a massive, massive tax benefit as a result. Angela Rayner's sale of her council house and avoiding capital gains tax um, and making a few thousand pounds is very small fry compared to that. And a lot of people say to me, well, ugh, this isn't a story that cuts through. It's quite complicated. I had to write, I wrote some notes about it today. You fill up a sheet of A4 very quickly trying to explain the story. But 
fundamentally, we are talking about someone who came from, came from nothing, worked very, very hard. I've got massive time for Angela Rayner on that. I don't like her calling people scum because she disagrees their politics. Um, I don't like her style in lots of ways. But actually, in terms of her, her you know, start in life, carer to her mum, single parent, coming to be deputy prime minister, possibly in a few months' time of this country, that is, I would say, something to be proud of in this country, actually. However, I don't care who you are, where you're from. I don't think you should be avoiding tax. I don't think you should be telling lies to the British public if you want to be the prime, deputy prime minister of this country. The idea that she used the right to buy a policy, which she now massively opposes, to buy her council house, made a big profit on over 48 grand, didn't pay capital gains tax on it because it was her primary property. You don't have to pay that on it. However, so many documents, official documents that she signed, children's birth certificates um, and all like, suggest that actually she was not living at this property. Neighbours have said she was living with her husband. She's got two young children. It's the first five years of her life, she was apparently not living with her husband and their young children. I mean, no one, no one sane believes that. They weren't divorced, they weren't separated, they were married with two young children, but they lived in separate houses a mile away from each other. No one in their right minds is going to believe this nonsense. And now, despite all of her denial and her insistence that she has had legal advice that says that she didn't do anything wrong, um, even though there are questions that her the electoral register, the birth certificates for her children, and uh, and her claim, you know, about for her council tax and not being not being due capital gains tax. None of these documents tally in terms of where she says she was living at that time. But how crucially, as Mail on Sunday, they've got loads of tweets that she sent out at this time, all saying, "Well, oh, just got home. Here are the cats. Here's my son having his dinner at our home." And they're all clearly, because there are pictures in the public domain of her husband's house, of her husband's house. She wasn't living in the house she said she was living in. Here's the question. Does any of this matter? Does any of this matter? If she said, it's all a lie, I'm so sorry, I'll pay the extra couple of thousand pounds in tax I'm due, um, sorry about that, does it all go away? Or is this more significant? Well, I, I think the public basically have the measure of this. I think they basically think all politicians are slightly on the make, that this isn't yeah. the crime of the century and, and that she's part of that. But here's the thing. Angela Rayner with Keir Starmer is going into government at the end of this year. The Tory Most party likely. are going to lose the next election, categorically, 100%. Uh, you know, some people have said 99 You work with Tory MPs, you're pretty sure of this. I'm telling you it's happening. Yeah. Right. Labour MPs are going to be elected in their masses. And we are going to see for the first time in a while that it's not only Tories that get caught with their trousers down and round their ankles, that there are going to be scandal after scandal after scandal in the Labour Party. And if you think it's been bad under the Tory party, it's going to be just as bad under Keir Starmer. And that is where I think we're going into an interesting place. Keir Starmer is one of the most untested mm. future prime ministers that this country's had in a long time. So are his shadow cabinet. So are his MPs going to be. And I can actually see, looking ahead three, four years, the wheels beginning to come off yeah. the Starmer pro when, programme when, quite when, quickly. When you actually put the lights on again. And, they, and Keir Starmer's talked about honesty and integrity. And he says there's no questions for Angela Rayner to answer, apart from the fact that he has not seen her legal advice, no one has seen her legal advice, that she says exonerates her from having done anything wrong. But she won't publish it, even though she's called on other people to publish the legal advice they've had. And again, I know it's small pride, fine, it's small money. But actually, I think for a lot of people, that's that, they're, that it makes, you know, it's, it's more understandable, actually, you know, people doing things like this. In terms of you can actually understand the sums of money involved as opposed to when people talk about millions or billions which most of us will never ever be in a position you know we'd all like to avoid paying five million pounds in tax and be in the position that that was even something that would happen in their lives can i also talk about william rack yes. the tory mp apparently caught up in a honey trap uh, sting grinder the gay dating website where for some reason despite being an elected mp and being a select committee chair, he thought it was a great idea to send a picture of his uh, naked member, it would appear, uh, to uh, uh, a complete stranger. Um, and then, what a surprise, he gets basically blackmailed and basically told, I want you to hand over numbers for various of your colleagues and political journalists and others. So he does it. Now, it seems to me that William Ragg has used the double defence, which we see often now, of, I'm gay, gay or trans works either way, I'm gay, and I have mental health problems. And for some reason, these are seen in some way, and I have no idea why, as a get-out clause for treachery and betrayal, not just of your colleagues, but possibly even of your country, by handing out numbers for people to a complete stranger so that they could also be blackmailed and, and face the same thing he did. He said sorry, he said he was weak, um, he is already standing down at the next election, but he's still a committee chair. 
we've had Chancellor Jeremy Hunt and Old Dan was surrounding him, saying, oh, you know, he did the right thing. What he did was absolutely outrageous, what he did, to hand out private numbers for senior colleagues and journalists to somebody who could be a Chinese spy, a Russian spy, a terrorist. We don't know. There is no excuse for this. Why on earth is he being protected? Look, I'm a political consultant. I normally charge for my advice, but here's a piece of free advice <laughs> for Tory MPs. <laughs> Don't! Say... If you are a 40-year-old, slightly overweight, balding, a bit awkward Tory MP, and all of a sudden a glamorous young lady, young man, whichever is your preference, gets in touch with you and says how attractive you are, says how wonderful you are, that there might just be something going on. And before you decide to take down your trousers, to uh, photograph oneself and to send it to this total stranger on the internet, just to think, uh, is it really likely that this 21-year-old, absolutely gorgeous, fantastic person is really into me because of, you know, yeah. my uh, enthusiasm But also just generally, jumpers? everybody, stop sending naked pictures of yourself to people. I find, as I confirmed on Friday, I have never sent any pictures of my erect penis to anyone. There we are. I still have more balls than most of the men who do whatever they do. <laughs> but there we are. Uh, look, lots more to talk about, an awful lot more to talk about uh, coming up uh, in the show. Uh, now, today, though, we are asking about this new poll which says almost half of British Muslims said they sympathise with Hamas. A uh, quarter of Muslims uh, say they don't believe they committed rape and murder on October the 7th. I want to know your reaction. You can give us a call on 0344 499 1000, text on 8722, or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Richard has done that and says, doesn't surprise me. Islamification of our society is well and truly underway. Michaela says, I can understand having sympathy for those Palestinian people who are not militant minded, but having sympathy for the terrorist group Hamas is mind blowing to me. And David says, they should leave the comfort of England and join Hamas in that case. Some of you have been getting in touch on the phones. Please keep those calls coming in. Let's go to Chris, who is in Surrey. Hello, Chris. Hello, Chris, are you there? Hello, hello, hello. Oh, we can't, we just lost Chris. What a shame, uh, absolute shame. Uh, Chris, we will try and get you back. If you can hear us and we can't hear you, we'll try and get you back on air, because uh, I'd love to hear what you have to say. Uh, do keep your messages coming in, particularly get in touch on the phone, 0344 499 1000, uh, about your reaction to that just extraordinary poll. And they did, they did also do a poll of, of the wider British society on average, and they did not come up with the same results. Uh, coming up, uh, we are going to be talking about more what's happening in Gaza. Israeli forces have largely withdrawn from southern Gaza. The move comes six months after the Hamas attacks on October the 7th. We'll talk about that. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer, and you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <Where is> it? <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... 
sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square because you just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you> know, <laughs> for yeah. minute, for... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. We're yeah, supposed to have was moved another on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV. Now, Israeli forces have largely withdrawn from southern Gaza. The move comes six months after the Hamas attacks on October the 7th, marked yesterday, as Israel and Hamas have both sent delegations to Cairo to join fresh ceasefire negotiations. This, as we have continuing pressure on the UK government to stop sending arms to Israel uh, under legal treaties. Well, joining me right now to discuss this is Barrister with UK Lawyers for Israel, Natasha Halstoff. Uh, good morning to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, also still with us, of of course, uh, is Sam Armstrong, who's joining us for the whole show. Um, Natasha, um, I just want to ask you, first of all, in terms of what is happening in terms of withdrawal of forces and negotiations, does this suggest, and we know more aid is now going into Gaza, still not enough, does this present a, an easier backdrop for the British government in terms of its legal position, in terms of sending arms to Israel, if there are more negotiations if more aid is going in and if we don't have an imminent threat of a strike against Rafa by IDF forces. Does that ease the position for the British government or does that have no bearing on it legally? I don't think the position has changed at all. And in fact, that letter, uh, which has been referenced, sent to the Prime Minister last week, was responded to pretty swiftly uh, by a letter calling out the inaccuracies in it, the, the errors... Can I clarify, this was a letter that was sent, I said, three su former Supreme Court judges, um, other 600 legal minds, the great and the good, basically saying we should suspend sales to, of arms to Israel because uh, under our legal treaties, legal obligations, you know, we could be in breach of those and urging the, the government to suspend those sales. This new letter has actually far more signatures and a similar level of the great and the good. Supreme Court justices, Court of Appeal justices, former chairman of the bar. Uh, we've also had a former director of public prosecutions, Lord MacDonald, um, former justice ministers. So, yes, and far more signatures. Yesterday, I think it had uh, already surpassed 1,200. And what are they saying? Why are they saying it's fine for us to carry on sending arms to Israel? Well, the first important um, purpose of the letter was to point out the serious error that the first letter fell into in terms of misstating what it was the International Court of Justice uh, had determined in January of this year when it made that provisional order at the request of South Africa. But there were other errors in that original letter, uh, for example, claiming that the Security Council resolution uh, that was recently passed calling for an immediate ceasefire was in any way legally binding. It's unfortunately, a, 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 in reality, it's a political resolution, yeah. not a legally binding one. And there was a, a reliance, unfortunately, on Hamas propaganda casualty figures in that initial letter also. So I don't think it's surprising that it's been called out so robustly um, in the first instance by the preeminent legal journalist Joshua Rosenberg, but very quickly uh, that same day subsequently by, as I say, over 1,200 lawyers, barristers D Does um, any of this judges. really matter, given that in terms of the arms that Israel has, less than 0.1% are actually provided by the UK, the vast majority uh, either made in Israel, provided by America, actually an awful lot come from Germany. Um, but does any of it really matter? Is this actually just sort of a sort of a dinner party principle virtue signal by uh, a number of lawyers who wrote the initial letter um, and politicians, that, you know, showing to the electorate who are concerned about civilian deaths, or oh, it's not us. Is this, is this just, 
Is this just virtue signaling and about principles, or does it actually have a practical implication for Israel or, and for Britain? Well, two aspects to that. First, I would say this is the opposite of virtue signaling. If in its hour of need, the UK is prepared to abandon its ally Israel, when Israel is essentially fighting our war for us against uh, these Islamist fundamentalist terror organizations. But more importantly than that, it does have a practical impact because it serves to encourage Hamas. These misstatements about international law and misstatements about the factual legal uh, and position on the ground um, serve, unfortunately, to encourage Hamas to prolong the conflict. They've walked away from those negotiations. Uh, the ceasefire proposal that was backed by the Americans, we've forgotten, it seems, entirely about the hostages, 133 of them uh, that we know still and hope still to be alive in Gaza. Uh, and the debate including the letter that we saw from the civil servants, which you referenced earlier, is being substantially influenced by this kind of... Well, no, the civil, these are civil servants within the government who are saying that they, they, they feel that they would have to go on strike and couldn't work if they were... Uh, if, if they disapprove of government policy, if breaking the law, if they believe that, you know, sending arms to Israel... I mean, absolute abject nonsense. Just do, do shut up. You don't make policy. You're a civil servant. That's literally the point of your job. But based on the misinformation which has yeah. now been called out by some of the most senior lawyers, former judges, solicitors, barristers in the country. There it does seem, and we discussed this before on the show with you, this, this complete mismatch of the public understanding of the international law regarding warfare and, uh, and, and the actual reality. Because, look, any, any reasonable person would be horrified by the deaths of any civilian, particularly children in Gaza. Anyone who's not horrified by that, he, he, frankly, is a monster. And also horrified by, yes, it doesn't matter more because they are British, but of course we feel more affinity. Three Brits who are working as aid workers among the seven who were killed in their aid convoy that were killed uh, more than a week ago uh, in, in Israel. Now, yeah, I knew the IDF admitted very soon afterwards, they did an investigation. It was them, it was a mistake, they've apologised. That doesn't make it OK for the families, friends and colleagues of those people. They've still lost their lives. Um, but um, we're told, you know, this is a war crime. This, this means that we must stop supporting Israel. They are brutal monsters. They've, they've, they've done this horrible crime. Um, under, under international treaties, under international uh, understandings of law in terms of warfare, these things are accepted, tragically, as things that happen, aren't they? Well, it is a big tragedy that friendly fire incidents are a significant percentage of casualties in any conflict. Israel has had friendly uh, soldiers um, from the IDF killed in friendly fire. There was the incident of the three hostages who were also uh, shot in this tragic incident uh, with the world central kitchen workers. What international law is based on is not an effects-based analysis, but an intention-based analysis. And Israel has been consistently clear about not just the way it upholds international law, but about the way that it goes far above the requirements of international law. And only yesterday, I interviewed John Spencer, who is an American. He teaches urban armed conflict. He's the head of urban armed conflict at West Point uh, in the United States. And he's been on the ground in Gaza and has consistently said, as a result of what he's seen, that Israel has gone further than any other army in the history of warfare, in the context where Hamas, of course, is seeking to use its breaches of international humanitarian law to its advantage, Israel has gone further. By, yeah, and by using... Uh, civilians as human, human shields, shields. Uh, using hospitals, schools, um, clinics, ambulances. We know from testimony from the hostages that were uh, successfully released that um, Hamas had been transporting them in ambulances. And so John Spencer and others, Colonel Richard Kemp, have been very clear having been on the ground there, about the standards that Israel is adhering to. And all of this, of course, is being um, misrepresented mm. by those... I've spoken to a number now of the signatories of that original letter who have essentially said that they've based their assessment on what they've seen on television. Well, isn't that an indictment of how the media, uh, broadly speaking, well, has been, been covering... If they'd been watching the, this show, well, then, they, they, then, they, then they might have actually had a more sensible view of it all. And, I mean, let's come to you, Sam Armstrong. It, 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 I mean, look, we've talked about this again and again in the last six months, but it, it, it does still amaze me, the number of people who are absolutely outraged by the death of civilians and, and the, the conduct of war when it's Israel, but never seem to have any issue at all with, you know, Assad murdering en masse, on a huge scale, his own civilians, remarkably unbothered about Saudi Arabia and, and people in Yemen, remarkably unbothered about, you know, um, what China is doing uh, to the region people. I mean, it, it, it is extraordinary how selective people are 
um, with with the, the, the countries and the victims that they choose to care about. There are people that are sitting and waiting, ready for Israel to make the slightest slip up in order to pounce on it. We saw it earlier in the conflict where it was suggested that Israel had bombed a hospital. It turned out it was, in fact, Palestinian Hamas terrorists. Uh, the, they are gleeful. They are rubbing their hands with delight at any chance to pile on to the only Jewish nation on earth. Now, there are an awful lot of commentators, some on the left of politics, British politics, that say that it has nothing, that there's, it's just a sheer coincidence that the only Jewish country on earth is the one country they single out for particular scrutiny, particular criticism yeah. that goes far beyond that of any other country. I don't believe it. No. I have reached the point now where I think Israel is being held to not just a higher standard, but a standard that simply doesn't exist in any other yeah. armed conflict in the history and, and, of war. And certainly not a standard we we require of our own uh, military, certainly. Um, can I also ask you, uh, uh, Natasha, about this extraordinary survey carried out by the Henry Jackson Society? They asked, um, they polled Muslims, they also polled a wider, you know, selection of the of the, the general public um, to see what the general view in this country is of things like um, Hamas uh, and events on October the 7th, but also what British Muslims thought. The, sh the results are shocking. I mean, well, although, interesting, as the, as the uh, Faisal Mughal, who founded the interfaith groups Tell Mama Faith Matters and Muslims Against Antisemitism, he said the findings are shocking, but also not shocking. Only one in four British Muslims, according to this survey, believe that Hamas did commit murder and rape in Israel on October the 7th, despite all the evidence that's been presented. Um, they also found in this poll that 46% of British Muslims, so almost half of British Muslims, said they sympathise with Hamas, a prescribed terrorist group that has boasted openly about the atrocities they committed on October the 7th, has said they will repeat that on every occasion when they can, and whose entire... Their constitution confirms they, they want the annihilation, not just of Israel, but the killing of every Jewish person. Not just in Israel, but in the entire world. The fact that there are people living in this country, many will be British-born and bred, same as me who believe that a terrorist organisation is someone they should sympathise with and that what has been reported in the news in the last six months is completely made up. What, is, what, is, what do you make of that? Well, I looked at some of the raw data of that polling um, and that included the question as to whether or not uh, the respondents thought that Israel was committing genocide against the Palestinians. 80% yeah. yeah. of the Muslims polled believed that to be correct. Uh, and amongst the wider population, it was 46%. Yeah. And the really, really concerning aspect when you look at the breakdown of the figures is that amongst the population uh, that has been to university... Yeah, it's higher. It's higher. Yes. And indeed, actually, in terms of um, whether or not Hamas committed murder and rape on October the 7th, um, uh, roughly a third of, of the wider population don't, don't believe it happened. What on earth is going on? Is this people? Is this people sort of reading their own sort of echo chamber of, of social media? Um, what, what, how on earth can people think that? Well, certainly in terms of the way that the legal issues have been presented, and genocide is uh, first and foremost in terms of the legal accusations that Israel mm. um, is uh, is facing. Well, people, I mean, people just need to get a dictionary to look up the word. Uh, or indeed uh, read the letter uh, that has yeah. been sent in response, uh, which um, addresses the International Court of Justice proceedings on this. Uh, and of course, any time this issue is being addressed, the, the critical aspect of that definition of, of genocide is intention, um, and it doesn't have any application here. Uh, it is a blood libel that is being advanced. And because it has These been... These are anti-Semitic so, tropes, basically. Well, absolutely. And when we think about, you know, the original blood libels, the anti-Semitic tropes in the Middle Ages, they were perhaps as widely believed as this polling now indicates yeah. that these falsehoods uh, are being uh, Terrifying accepted. is the word I would use. Terrifying. We have a very, very big problem, and I think it's a very big problem across the whole of Western society. I mean, it's a damn sight bigger in the Middle East, uh, but we have a problem. We have, we've, Im we've imported it here. I'm sorry, we have. Um, Natasha, really appreciate you joining us. Uh, Natasha Hausdorff, she's a barrister uh, for uh, with UK Lawyers for Israel. Um, just stay with us while I, I get some more audience reaction, though, to that poll we were just talking about, because we're asking about this poll. It says almost half of British Muslims said they sympathise with Hamas. I want to know your reaction. Uh, also, uh, only a quarter believe that there was actually rape and murder by Hamas on October the 7th in Israel. Give us a call, 0344 499 1000, text on 8722, or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Heather says, if that is how they feel, the UK is probably the wrong place for them. Nick says, it's interesting that it's that low. 
given how restrictive their religion is. I wonder how this figure is changing over time. And Roger says, I don't know why this is a surprise to anyone. You've also been getting in touch on the phones. Do you keep those calls coming in? Let's go to Alan, who actually is listening from Israel. Good morning to you, Alan. Good morning. Although it's afternoon now for afternoon. me, Julia, I'm happy to say good morning to you. And I really appreciate you and your guest, sorry, I don't know his name, for the way you're covering this. Sam Armstrong and Natasha. It, what, do you, what do you want to say? What do you make of this poll? OK. Uh, well, first of all, I'm totally not surprised. What people don't really know because the media doesn't cover it, there is a website called thereligionofpeace.com which covers all that's going on within the Islamic, and I'm talking about the terrorist uh, world of Islam, uh, which well, is sponsored by Iran. The thing is, they have shown there's been over 2,000 deadly terrorist attacks every year um, since 9-11. And they've, so they've got over 44,000 uh, attacks, deadly terrorist attacks going on. The world doesn't want to talk about this, and so I, I would hate to have been born a Muslim in a Muslim society where you can't even get out of it uh, comfortably without But, but fear that doesn't being mean, killed. I mean, I've always said, you know, there is, there is Islam. We have tough, in this country, far too much Islamist extremism, but that is a minority. It's That's sadly it. not what... a small enough minority, but we also, but then we have an awful lot that would appear a large minority of, of, of Muslims in this country who who very sympathetic to a... a a, a, a terrorist group. Why do you think they are? Well, I, I think they, we don't actually know what the real percentage is because they have what they call takia, which is deception. You can go in as not a very, but in fact you are. Uh, you know, so we don't really know how many, and I'm sure that I would hate to have been born into a Muslim society. Can I, can I point out that the biggest victims of, of Islamist terrorism, actually the biggest number of victims, are, are Muslims. Yes, but they, they have enough numbers that they're not worried about... So, you know, I'm talking about the people at the top pushing all this. Yes. You know, but that's it. And we have to be very careful. It's really important, Alan, that, again, that, you know, that we, people are not all tarred with the same brush and the average person no, just trying to live I, their completely I, normal life, regardless of what their faith is, not supporting this. And even someone saying they're sympathetic to Hamas, um, you know, again, are they just reading different stuff on social media than you and I are reading? Or maybe they're afraid to say something else, you know, depending on where, which, what they're having to live within. Okay. You know, you know how, how it, it, for example, in the Palestinian territories, if anyone criticizes Hamas or criticizes, yeah. uh, uh, they are taken out as called Israeli collaborators. Yeah. They, they don't have a free voice. That's that that, that is absolutely part. crucial. I'm going to have to leave it there, Alan. Thank you so much for getting in touch. for a lovely afternoon there in Israel. We had such far reach. Uh, coming up after the break, we're going to talk more about Angela Rayner. She's facing fresh questions over her denial of claims that she may have wrongly avoided capital gains tax and lied on official documents over her council house sale. I'm Julia Harley Brewer, and you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to ab and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman. Isn't that? Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Ooh, <we're missing. laughs>
There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. We're supposed to, her. We're supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV. Now, Angela Rayner is facing yet more tax questions over her denial of claims that she may have wrongly avoided capital gains tax and broken electoral law over the sale of her council house many years ago. The Labour's deputy leader's own tweets showing her family home at the time suggest she did break the rules. Joining me right now is former editor of Labour List and former Labour advisor Peter Edwards. Hello, Peter. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Now, this story's been ongoing for a couple of months now, um, and, and a lot of the papers are going on it, but it doesn't seem to have broken into sort of the, the I suppose, the, the public sort of mind quite so much, because it's quite a complicated story. Most of us never have to pay capital gains tax. We haven't bought a council house and made a profit on it. But fundamentally, the accusation is that Angela Rayner basically played, was a bit dodgy on, on some forms, claimed she wasn't living in a house, and claimed she was living in a house that she wasn't really living in, um, and, and, and signed a form and made a bit of money and didn't pay tax on it that she should have paid at the time, and has subsequently lied. Now, the latest development is the Mail on Sunday finding a whole load of tweets that she posted at the time that she claimed she was living at her, uh, at her own house that she sold, when actually she keeps referring to the house that she says her husband was living in with her children, very bizarrely, in their first few years of marriage, um, um, where, where she keeps referring to this house as home. Just got home, here are the kids at home, oh, look at the cats at home, and the pictures are clearly of her husband's house, not her house. Um, has she been caught bang to rights? No, I don't think so. I mean, uh, but your intro was right. The Westminster bubble gets notoriously excited um, with things around MPs' own personal contacts, and then you go out leafleting, as I do, and uh, folk want to know when they can get a GP's appointment and a pothole fixed. But I think tax is important because it's about integrity and honesty. And I, I do believe Angela Rayner is a person of honesty and integrity. And I make the other point, and again, I'm sure lots of your viewers will comprise this, that people do often live in two different locations. That might be because they're blended families, um, uh, where you're trying to keep things stable for the children. Or lots of my friends have lived in um, kind of split locations because of jobs, if you're doing something like working in a school when well, you're tired oh, yeah, to and if one, one of you's living on one end of the country and the other end, and there's a temporary, a temporary period of that, I understand. These houses are a mile apart. She's newly married. Two of her young children were registered at, at the different address. I mean, I'm sorry. There's basically every single official document that she signed either says for tax benefit that she lived at the, the address that she sold or her husband's address. All of the stuff that's just the registering my child, electoral registrar, she's, she's, at, she's at the wrong address. Look, it doesn't add up. And I completely get people are more worried about paying their own bills, getting a hospital appointment, getting their kids into a decent school than they are about what Angela Rayner did back in 2007 when she sold her property at uh, council. However, People also understand the notion, as you talk about, honesty and integrity. When she says, I've had legal advice that says I didn't do anything wrong, but refuses to publish it. When Keir Starmer says she's done nothing wrong, but he says he hasn't seen the legal advice, she hasn't shown it to him. 
We don't know that she's not done anything wrong. Well, if she's not done anything wrong, why doesn't she do what she has told all these other politicians to do? Publish the legal advice that she's been given. Well, I'd say she's put into the public domain more information than nearly any other MP about their separation, about their children and about their housing. And these well, they are all weren't quite separated in the first five matters. years of their marriage, were they? Sorry? They weren't separated in the first five years of their marriage, were they? Well, I think the one thing I've learned is, is I, I'm not going to give a view on other people's family lives when I don't know the detail. But I don't, I pick up one thing. I'm not sure Tory MPs have published their own tax advice on any topic. Nadine Zahawi no. gave a report. No, they haven't, but she demanded settlement. that they do it. So if she thinks they should have done it, look, I'm, you know, I called for Nadine Zahawi to go. Um, because he didn't pay £5 million of tax that was due. I thought it was outrageous that Rishi Sunak's multi-millionaire uh, wife and heiress to a billionaire was claiming non-dom tax status uh, when she's clearly living in this country, married to the Prime Minister of this country, where she was, he was then Chancellor, and two kids at school here. I think it's outrageous and, and, and deeply wrong that they did those things. And, and, and they, I mean, they paid the tax now, the... Uh, 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 Rishi Sunak's family and, and, and Nadine Sahawi is forced to resign. Is it tenable, though, that Angela Rayner can become Deputy Prime Minister of this country when there are big question marks about whether or not she's honest? Because if this had all come out in this book by Lord Ashcroft, The Red Queen, his new biography of her, and she'd gone, oh, yeah, I think I did make a mistake there. I um, said sorry, paid the money back. End of story. But she's doubled down. And you know, you know as well as I do, you've been around a long time as well. Um, but actually, it's always the cover-up afterwards that undoes you in the end. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do believe Angela Rayner is honest. And when I was out leafleting for Labour yesterday, this didn't come up on a single door. But you make a broader point absolutely correctly, which is um, it's always the, uh, the conspiracy or the screw-up that gets people in trouble rather than the original error. And we saw that infamously, really, with uh, Chris Hewn, the former Liberal Democrat yeah. cabinet minister, over speeding and his ex-wife, Vicky Price. But but to come back to this, I, I do believe Angela Rayner is honest. And I make one other broad well, point. No, hold on a minute, hold on a minute. No, no, you believe she's honest. So was she honest when she said on one official document that she lived at one house and at the same time in the same year and another official document said she lived somewhere else? When was, Which time was she being honest? Well, which of the documents to well, which you're referring to? Well, on the electoral roll and the birth certificates for her children, both official documents for which there is a penalty for stating an untruth, she says she lives in one property in one of them and another property in the other. I don't get confused about where I live. I put my home down. Yes, but people do move, don't they? They didn't. She didn't claim to have moved. She had, her defence has not been that she moved. Her defence is that she lived yeah. in one particular property. But she didn't put that property down as her home when her children were born. But the thrust of the Mail on Sunday's allegations yesterday was about her social media posts. And I, I come back to this wider point that wrongdoing has not been proven. And in a workplace, if, if you said to a colleague, if you're CEO and you said to a colleague, well, nothing's actually been proven, but we want okay. you to resign anyway, well, that, nothing, that would be great. You say unfair. nothing's been proven. The facts are out there and none of them tally, but there we are. We'll have to leave it. Thank you so much, Peter Edwards. Appreciate that from Labour List, or formerly Labour List. Uh, coming up after the break, Israeli forces have largely withdrawn from southern Gaza. We're also going to be talking about what on earth is going on with Tory MP William Bragg and that honey trap. I'm Julia Hartley-Brewer, and you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. 
May might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <it's here. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just yeah. for... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good morning and welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. And I'm with you live from 10 until 1. Coming up in this hour, we're going to be talking about Israeli forces that have largely withdrawn from southern Gaza. The move comes six months after the Hamas attacks on October the 7th. This as Israel and Hamas both sent delegations to Cairo to join fresh ceasefire negotiations. But does this have any bearing on whether or not we in Britain should be sending arms to Israel? And Downing Street is facing calls to take more action against Tory MP William Bragg after he, or any action at all indeed, after he admitted betraying his colleagues by handing over MPs' phone numbers after being caught in a honey trap sting on a dating website. And Pfizer is accused of making misleading claims over its COVID vaccine by the UK's pharmaceutical watchdog. They say Pfizer has discredited the industry. This, plus Shadow Health Secretary Wes Streeting, warns that there will be no extra funding for the NHS under a Labour government without the major surgery of reform. I'll talk about all of that. First, though, let's get the latest news headlines with Jay Akbar. Good morning. Palestinians have started to return to the city of Khan Yunus after Israel withdrew almost all its troops from southern Gaza. Officials believe the IDF has reduced its number of troops in the region so they can regroup before targeting Rafah, where hundreds of thousands are sheltering. Assad Rahman from the anti-poverty charity War on Want says that would mean more violence and more deaths. The majority of the Palestinian people in, in Gaza now have been internally displaced. They're trapped into an area smaller than the size of Heathrow Airport without food, sanitation. I think the voice as around the world quite clearly and quite rightly now are calling for an immediate ceasefire that we have to end this violence to end this indiscriminate killing of of innocent palestinian men women and children the un's atomic watchdog has warned a new drone attack on ukraine's Zaporizhia power plant raises the risk of a major nuclear accident Russia's nuclear power corporation has accused Ukraine's military of carrying out the strikes, but Ukraine denies involvement. Three people were injured. The plant's Russian-installed administration said radiation levels were normal and there was no serious damage. Here, a major manhunt continues after a 27-year-old mum was stabbed and killed while pushing her baby in a pram in Bradford. Police say Habiba Massam is wanted over the attack and that he's known to the victim, but they won't confirm how. Former Detective Superintendent Shabnam Chowdhury told Talk Today there will be great urgency to track him down.
One day may not seem a lot of time to many people, but in the life of a murder investigation, that's a significant amount of loss of evidence and the golden hours, which are really crucial at this time. The police will be looking at CCTV, any digital footprint that he may have left behind in terms of where he's gone. Chaos continues across the rail network this morning with train drivers walking off the job in their third day of major strike action over pay and working conditions. Staff at 16 train companies are taking part, causing cancellations, delays or no service at all to some areas. Passengers who spoke with Talk TV had mixed views. I think this could go on forever at the rate things are going. It's, yeah, they're getting how much a year? It's, it's very difficult to say how much more they could want, really. It's about safety and stuff and their work environment, so I think they've got to do what they need to do until they get noticed, you know? It obviously causes disruption trying to commute in today. I've got an important meeting to sort of run this afternoon, so, you know, drives a bit concerned. Times are hard for everyone, I think, aren't they? So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's difficult. Boeing is under investigation after a plane part fell off during takeoff yesterday in the US. The Southwest flight was departing from Denver with 135 passengers on board when an engine cowling detached. It managed to turn back and land safely. This does follow other safety concerns at Boeing. And a charity is calling for tanning salons to have graphic warning signs similar to those found on cigarette packets to warn customers about the dangers of using sunbeds. Skin Cancer UK says the move could save lives and is calling on the government to update laws and make warning signs mandatory. It's estimated there are almost 17,000 cases of melanoma in the UK each year. That's the latest. Now time for the weather with Nazni and Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello. We're still looking at rather unsettled conditions for today and, in fact, for this week. Today, it's uh, in the form of a name storm by Meteor France that is bringing wet weather across many northern and western parts of England and Wales. And later this afternoon and into tonight, there will be a bunch of showers moving northwards over central, southern and eastern areas. But for many parts of central northern Scotland, it will be mostly fine and bright. Northern Ireland, though, will see some rain through this afternoon. And overnight, the winds will strengthen down towards the southwest with gusts up to around 70 miles per hour. There is a warning from the Met Office for that. And the rain continues its journey further northwards up towards Scotland and northern England, where there is a warning for the south and east of Scotland, as there could be the risk of localised flooding from the rains there. Elsewhere, mostly dry and uh, clear with uh, rather cool conditions compared to the last few nights. But there will be lots of showers across the parts of the Midlands, central and eastern England that will continue there through tomorrow. The rain will also continue across much of Scotland, some of it turning wintry across the Highlands and there will be rain across parts of Wales, easing later across southern areas in the south. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good morning. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer and you are with Talk TV. Lots to talk about at home and abroad and running through all the biggest stories of the day with me is commentator Sam Armstrong. Still stuck with me. Thanks for staying. Or as I always love it to start a Monday morning with you. Loads to talk about. Look, we talked a little bit earlier about what's going on in Israel and, and Gaza. Um, six months on, obviously yesterday, their anniversary of the October 7th massacre. And the thing that I found absolutely stunning was this Henry Jackson Society poll uh, taken, you know, of interestingly, of British Muslims, but also of the wider general British public as well as a comparison for where people stand on what is going on uh, in Gaza and what happened on October the 7th. And the results were, I mean, shocking. I mean, absolutely shocking. Perhaps there's lots of people saying not surprising if you've been paying attention in recent years. Similar polls taken after the 7-7 attacks here in London revealed also some very worrying, large disparity between the views of the general public and uh, the, the smaller Muslim population. But this poll has shown, I think, absolutely outrageous that 46% of British Muslims said they sympathise with Hamas, obviously much higher than the general population. Also, that only one in four British Muslims believe that Hamas committed murder and rape in Israel on October the 7th. I mean, astonishingly, um, 
only 62% of the general public think that. So what on earth do the other 38% think? There'll be a load of don't knows in there, obviously. But if you've been watching TV, reading newspapers, knowing what's going on, listening to the radio, you would know what's going on. You would see the evidence before your own eyes. You know, unless you're Owen Jones, obviously, when apparently, unless, unless it's a Hollywood starlet saying, oh, he touched my bottom. That's definitely to be believed. But when you've actually got evidence from someone who hid in a bush for, for hours on end while watching people gang rape um, a, a friend of hers, no, that, that doesn't count as evidence. Doesn't count as evidence. But, but how, I mean, how worrying is this? And what, what does it tell us? If people in this country who who maybe even born in this country, a large number of these people will be born in this country, support a prescribed terrorist organization, have sympathy for them, and don't believe the reports they see on their TV and radios every night. We have a small proportion of this country that are far right and they hold unacceptable views. And every person that you just listed, all of those people, if there was a scintilla of evidence that that level of people had held those views, there would be a national outrage. The news would stop for days and days and yeah. days until we got to the bottom of this. We have accepted in this country that it is acceptable to basically deny evidenced atrocities yep. against Jews. In my mind, denying what happened on October the 7th is akin to denying the Holocaust. In fact, it's arguably worse because there is so much more evidence. It's so recent. You can go and speak and see people. They boasted of it themselves. This is one of the crucial things. It's not something that Israel said happened. And indeed, the numbers, we were told it was 1,400. That was then revised down to just over 1,100. And you know, we've actually had, you know, Israel has, when they've revised the story, they have less, they have less exaggerated. We look, we had some claims early on about 40 babies being beheaded, uh, which was not true. One too many. Um, I, I don't know why I feel the need to add that bit, but one too many. But there were some stories, there were some reports, obviously some miscommunication between IDF soldiers and some reporters, and some stories got out that were not true. But, but those are the tiny minority. As you say, a lot of the knowledge we have is actually stuff that Hamas itself has put out. Not stuff that just found on their body cam imagery, but, but actually images that they have put out themselves of what they have done. They've said they've committed atrocities and they would do so again. It is literally in their, the, the makeup of their organisation, their constitution, that this is what they would do. But what does it mean for our society if... And it's a growing population, the Muslim population in this country, and, and people who are born in this country, go to, you know, to school with, 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 with non-Muslims and live alongside Muslims and work alongside non-Muslims, who I would, well, I brought up a, you know, a, a, a liberal atheist, you know, would, would never dream of not accepting as fellow Brits. But if there, is, if there is a growing minority of people in this country who hold views where they are supporting a terrorist organisation that has done this, there is something we need to talk about. Over 40% of British Muslims, according to this poll, believe in certain circumstances that they can be sympathetic towards those admitting that they rape and kill Jews. They live alongside Jewish people in this country. I believe firmly that if this attitude is not targeted aggressively, if it is not surgically removed from British society... What do you mean by that? I, I mean that we need to start looking at the kind of things that President Macron has done in France. Go after these organisations that are peddling this dangerous misinformation. That means going into mosques... And the hate preachers. ...and shutting them down if necessary. Yeah. Because I do not believe it is sustainable in the long term to have this filth, dangerous, nasty, murderous hatred spouted every Friday's in, in mosques across this country. And that is the only conceivable And it's being taken up by the left wing uh, uh, in this country as well. I mean, some other stats that were found by this is a was, survey was carried out by JL Partners. The polling company was founded by James Johnson. He's the former Downing Street pollster, very reputable. Almost half of British Muslims, again, 46%, say Jews have too much power over UK government policy. That compares to 16% of the general public. Uh, they believe on average, British Muslims are 41% that Jews have too much power in the media uh, and 39% say Jews have too much power in the UK's financial system. And a lot of this is you know, basic sort of anti-Semitic trope stuff, isn't it? But we know, again, people like me who get accused of Islamophobia for stating the simple fact that we know that Jew... Let's call it what it is, Jew hatred in the Middle East is widespread among the general population and, 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 and fomented often by their leaders... Um, and that the when you when you import large proportion of population from countries where this is 
a normalised, accepted viewpoint, you're going to have this in our country. But you say in terms of tackling it, I think Emmanuel Macron of France, he has actually gone much harder on trying to tackle this. They have, I would say, a bigger problem in terms of, of, of certainly the terrorist atrocities they're seeing as well. Um, and they've quite really woken up to it. But, but how do we tackle that without, without pushing people who, who are, have mainstream views further to, to the extremes? Because what is really fascinating in this is that the younger you are, the higher educated you are as a British Muslim in this country, the more likely you are to believe these things. Look, I'm, I'm not a liberal, I'm a conservative. I'm pretty open about that. Uh, but here's the thing, if you believe in liberal democracy, there comes a point where you have to muscularly defensively, robustly defend that from those that don't believe you in it. You can't be tolerant of intolerance. You have to, at a level, say that, you know what, it is not acceptable to come into this country from overseas. Let's just say as part of our migration policy. If you believe that it is acceptable under any circumstances to rape and murder Jewish people, because... Or indeed... It, Anyone. <laughs> or, or indeed anyone. But let's be honest here, Julia, we don't have a problem with uh, hatred of Muslim people. I don't believe that there is a community in this country that would accept that 40% of people believe that it is acceptable to do this kind of thing to them. Well, there I do, are, I there do are think there are, yes, there are far-right groups. There are absolutely yes. problems with anti-Muslim hatred, but there is not a single, you know, other community. There have been blow-ups in the recent years between the Hindu and the Muslim community in Leicester, for example. I guarantee you go into the Hindu community tomorrow, you ask these same questions, you wouldn't catch numbers anywhere like this it. Is this is, where is we a specific We can't tackle the issue resolving. unless we acknowledge the issue. And it is interesting how little play this poll has got. And I said it reminds me of the poll that was taken by Channel 4 post 7-7 in London uh, after the terrorist attacks here. And, and obviously they wanted to prove that, look, see, you know, People share the same views, people have whatever faith, and it showed absolutely that was not the case, and people justifying what had happened there. Um, look, I want to hear from you on this because this is very, very alarming. We ask about this new poll which says almost half of British Muslims said they sympathise with Hamas. What is your reaction? Give us a call 0344 499 1000, text 87222, get in touch on X at Talk TV. Calls are charged at the national rate. Text costs one standard network rate message. Uh, let's also talk about, um, I saw to go on, I know I'm banging on about this, but it, it, Angela Rayner. And her house sale. Um, we've gone through the details of it before. If you've not tuned in until just now, serves you right. Uh, but latest evidence that she did not tell the truth and told some porkies about where she was living so she could basically sell a house that she wasn't living in and not pay capital gains tax on it after buying it as a council for a house. She got £48,000 profit, should have paid capital gains tax on it, is the allegation. She says she's had legal advice, hasn't done anything wrong. However, the latest evidence, Mail on Sunday have got, all publicly available. Loads of tweets that Angelina, 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 Angela Rayner wrote um, during the period where she claimed she was living at this property, and that's why it was her main property, didn't, wasn't due tax on it, when actually all of the pictures of her saying, I've just come home, here I am at home, here are the cats at home, is my son's at home, were all in her husband's house that she claimed he lived in with the kids but not her. Quite apart from the, who gets married and for the first five years of their marriage doesn't live with their husband and kids? Give me a break. The evidence is mounting that she has told Porky's. Does any of this matter, given we're looking at a few thousand pounds <clears throat> um, not, not paid in tax, if that is the case? Do you think anyone cares about this? Or is this a matter of, you may well in a few months' time be Deputy Prime Minister of this country. You are being caught out in lies. Look, you can't claim on the birth certificate for your son to be living in one house and on the electoral register to be living in another house. You, you, that doesn't that doesn't fly. You, both of those documents are official documents. You have to say this. You have to tell the truth on both of them. They can't both be true, and your tweets can't all be true. If what you've said to us since, do you think it's? Do you think this will bring her down? Do you think that Keir Starmer has questions to answer? Ref not not actually asking her to provide proof to him that she hasn't lied. Look, the trouble with this scandal is it's so complicated that, that it, people simply aren't... It's not cutting through, like, uh, your more classic Westminster scandal. But here's well, the thing. It just took me about 20 minutes to explain it this, briefly. This yeah. is our problem. But, look, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, pass the sniff test. I don't think there's anybody that has looked at this that genuinely believes that Angela Rayner has told the truth about what's gone Including, on. Including, do you think, her lawyer that gave her legal advice that she's chosen not to publish? including her lawyer, including Keir Starmer, everybody knows that she's done it. Now, if I was her, I would simply... You can write to the government and pay extra tax. 
That's what I would do. I'd pay it with interest. She's, she's not doing that at the moment. It's not going to cut through. But I do think it's a harbinger of what is to come, which is so many Labour MPs are going to get caught up in these kind of things. And there's this old... Because there's been scrutiny on the Tories because they've been in power. That's right. And it's same like with four UK candidates getting scrutiny now. There's a possibility that they might get become MPs. And there's this old adage in politics. Tories get taken down by sex. Yeah. Labour MPs time and time again are caught out by money, often because they're not coming from a place with money and the way they've got to where they've got is by being a little bit cheeky. Well, although, times. again, we've seen you know, the likes of Nadim Zahawi having to resign from government and go quite rightly. I'm, 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 I am, as anyone who's watched me or read what I've... or listened to me or read what I've been writing about for, since my political journalist career, I am absolute stickler on this stuff. And going back to you know, 2008-9 and the MPs' expenses, you know, sorry, you don't get to do that. I mean, you've got to remember, people say, oh, it's a small fry, it doesn't matter. People, people lost their jobs because of claiming for a bath plug in a pro second yeah. property that wasn't really their second property, uh, you know, for, for buying a flat screen telly. People get really, really angry, and I think rightly so, about politicians on the take. And, and let's just make the one point that I think is more legitimate, actually, than the capital gains tax, which is she bought this property at a discount yeah. according to have to follow certain rules about right to buy. Now, this is, let's not forget, a politician who is opposed to right to buy, right? She opposes it. <laughs> yeah. But herself took the discount. And that discount, you get to buy your council house, but it does come with a rule, which is you do have to live in that house for five years. Yeah. She didn't do And we that. know most of those council houses that were bought have been sold off and now are rented out at higher, higher rent, rents, aren't they? And again, I'm, I'm opposed to the selling off of council houses. I think if you've got enough money to buy a council house, you should sod off into the private sector and rent a new home. It's not your home. We've been, we've been subsidising it for you, but there we are. Um, you talk about sex scandals, but let's talk about a sex scandal that apparently, oh, no one in government seems to be bothered by. William Rack, now, little known uh, Tory MP, but a, a select committee chair, um, he got caught up in a honey trap sting. He, for some bizarre reason, thought it was a great idea when someone contacted him through the gay dating website uh, Grinder to send that man, or woman, whoever it was, but who he thought was a man, uh, a picture of his naked todger, by all accounts, uh, compromising pictures. Um, and then this person started asking for uh, telephone numbers of some of his colleagues. He handed over, he's admitted, he's ashamed and out, humiliated and terribly sorry, but he handed over phone numbers uh, for various parliamentary colleagues and also some political journalists as well. I mean, including female colleagues as well, to a complete stranger who was basically blackmailing him, otherwise these photos were going to come out. He said he's sorry. We've had Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor, and others all going, oh, it's terrible. Now, Seems to me William Ragg is playing two classic cards, and we've seen this. We've seen this with a, a, an MP who claimed that he was trans, which is why, for some reason, it was OK for him to drink drive. We've seen him claiming, well, you know, because he's gay, it's a different issue. Yeah, you're sending a picture of your todger to a complete stranger, but that's just fine. If it was to a woman, do you think they'd be making uh, uh, so many excuses for it? Um, and he's also, we're told, suffering from some mental health issues. I'm so sorry. I don't believe that being gay or suffering from mental health issues is a get-out-of-jail clause or get-out-of-basic morality clause for selling your colleagues down the river. I think, William Rag, that you're a traitor. A traitor not just to your colleagues, but to your country. When you gave out uh, those numbers, you didn't know whether they were going to someone who was just going to blackmail other people. You didn't know whether they were going to be perhaps Russian uh, spies were working for the Chinese that were going to try and extort information that could undermine our country. I think it's an absolutely outrageous thing. Now, he's an MP. He's resigning as an MP. We're standing down at the next election. But he's still a select committee chair. He's still being protected and supported and, and, and you know, and, and covered up for. I think this is an absolute outrage. I think this man is, is, is a traitor to his country. I really do. I think what he did was absolute treacherous betrayal. And everyone's just shrugging. Yeah, and we shouldn't forget, of course, that William Ragg, as was reported over the weekend, was one of those politicians that stood in judgment oh, yes. over Boris Johnson, actually recently over Speaker Hoyle, I think rightly in that case. But this is someone who has never been afraid in the past to judge. Yeah. But I tell you what those politicians didn't do. They didn't play the victim Olympics game that he, oh, William Boris Ragg Johnson has does. Oh, does play the Olympics game. No, come off it. Boris Johnson did not say, I was at home, I was depressed, so I needed to have a karaoke party. 
but I can slightly <laughs> imagine William Ragg doing so. I had mental health problems. It was so awful, I needed to get out the, 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 the we're pop not, We're not dismissing mental health problems. It's just not a get-out-of-jail card. It is not a get-out-of-jail-free card. And I'm, I'm sorry, but, like, it, it, it just doesn't help your case, no. actually. In fact, if anything, I think the excuse makes it worse. So, I'm sorry, you were being subjected to blackmail by somebody who's you had sent these pictures to, and rather than report it to the police, what you decided to do is open up even more people to, to that blackmail. Horror. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm really sorry. There's a really simple solution. Can, oh, can anyone think what the solution to this is? Oh, what is it? Oh, don't send pictures of your naked member <laughs> to a complete stranger, or indeed anybody. Can everyone please stop sending pictures of their penises, mostly men? Some women, some women maybe, apparently, according to Keir Starmer, some women could send pictures of their naked penises. But as a general rule, naked, erect penises, no, or flaccid. No one wants to see them. No one wants to see them. Stop doing it. It's really, really simple. I, for one, can guarantee I will not send pictures of my penis to anyone. So there we are. Um, let's also talk about, um, well, again, uh, youngsters who are affected by uh, such things. Cass report is out on Wednesday. Now, this was a wonderful report uh, from uh, a, a highly, just a really highly qualified expert into the Tavistock Clinic and transgender uh, 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 medicalization of, of, of children. And this report on Wednesday, we understand, is going to talk about social transitioning of kids. We're seeing this increasingly, even in primary schools, where teachers are basically saying, oh, yes, Johnny, we'll call you her and she, that's fine, we'll call you Jane. Parents not being told about it, only finding out on a parent's evening, if then. They're saying that this social transition kids, far from helping confused children, is actually risking them psychological harm, doesn't help them at all, and actually puts them on the railroad tracks directly towards going on, uh, you know, puberty blockers and then uh, going on to surgery and other things. Um, I'm still amazed that this is happening. I don't know how many times we have to talk about it. Government ministers have said to me, publicly and privately, oh, we're doing all we can. Oh, my God, you're going to be out of office in a few months' time. Enshrine in law that schools can't do this. Enshrine in law that clinics can't do this. Even stopping the Tavistock Clinic uh, from being able to... and the NHS being able to carry on giving puberty blockers and things. Totally unproven, desperately dangerous uh, medication to children. Um, totally untested. But they're allowed to give... The, private clinics still being allowed to do it. Why won't this government get to grips with this and, and act on as safeguarders of children's health? This has been shocking social mass experimentation yep. on children. Absolutely. We have no idea whatsoever what the long-term effects are of pumping hormones, chemicals into kids. We have no idea as to whether it might help a confused child to go along with their fantasy, their delusion, and I'm afraid I do this put it that, that high, that they are, in fact, not the boy that they are, but are, are, in fact, a girl. We have no idea whether, when this mixes up, as it inevitably does with clusters of autistic children, whether this is good, whether this is bad... Well, we do we, know. We know it's bad. Well, we know it's bad. We know it's dangerous. But, Julia... We don't medicalise children unless there's a... Re unless you're, you, you need to. We have all been told to lie about it. We have all been told it is unacceptable to believe that it is a bad idea to pump kids full of hormones from the opposite gender. You're not supposed to give them Calpol too often, for God's sake. So why on earth you'd be doing this? And again, these are untested. It is extraordinary this has happened. We're going to talk up to Carl Hendigan uh, about various other aspects of the uh, of what's going on in the NHS a little bit later. I might, I might ask him about this as well. But it is extraordinary that, that, that a Conservative government has allowed this to happen on their watch. It's the, the, the explosion has happened on their watch and failing to do enough about it, I think. It's all been too little, too late, but we're going to wait and see that report on Wednesday. Can I just ask you also about just one final story uh, in this section? Um, this record-breaking African run oh. by this... We're told by, you know, the, this, this hard man and loads and loads and loads of footage uh, of this hardest geezer, Russ Cook, record-breaking 10,000-mile African run. He's run all the way from the tip of South Africa uh, up to Tunisia in 352 days as 10,100-mile run. Um, he celebrated on Sunday after, we, after crossing 16 countries, running the equivalent of 385 marathons. He has also raised about half a million quid for charity, and that's wonderful. But it's now claimed that actually someone did do this 14 years ago. <laughs> had already done it. But... And I don't know if this is just because I'm a woman, because I know a lot of men like this stuff. And you see all the people who are joining him. If you're watching on the telly, uh, you can see all these men who are joining him for the final leg. Um, I don't know why people do this stuff. What is the point of it? I mean, I know he's raised money for charity, and that's brilliant. But A, doesn't he have a job? And B, why? 
Well, no, we blokes, we want to do something. We want to tick it off the list. We want to be the first to do something. He was really Don't the first. Don't kill cancer. Do something useful. Well, you know, people play sports. They take up golf. They go cycling. It's uh, it's part of the male. What is it? It's the whole line. I'm going to be the first person to walk across Antarctica. You know, Barefoot. wearing a yellow hat or something. It's just like I don't. I can understand the first to go somewhere. I get that. Yes. The fastest. I get that. Or is the person pulling a donkey on a sled? I mean, I don't. But a I normal bloke can't guess. be the first to go to Mars. We all wish we were the first to go to Mars. I don't want to be the do first it. to go to Mars. I want to stay alive. Thank you. The first person to go to Mars ain't coming back from Mars. That's the key thing. We'll send Elon. He'll be happy. Um, but I don't. Is it? Is this a boy-girl thing? Yeah, it is absolutely one hundred percent categorically a boy thing. Because I can, you're smiling I can see to attract about this. You're going, I can see it. This is great. Yeah. I always, whenever I think about these people, I always think, don't you have a job though? What, 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 you had a whole year off from work. What, how did you fund this? Well, he is a veteran, to be fair to the oh, guy. No, he's, done, he's done more useful things than you or I have ever done. Th th that's right. He's raised about £500,000 yep. more for charity Brilliant. than me this year. Yeah. Uh, so, you but know, all good on I'm not doing him down. I just... I don't get it. Please, can you get in touch and explain this to me? Also, I, I want you to get in touch uh, and talk to me about this new poll which says almost half of British Muslims said they sympathise with Hamas. I want to know your reaction. You've heard mine uh, and you've heard Sam's. Give us a call, 0344 499 1000, text 87222. We'll get in touch on X at Talk TV. Well, let's get to some of the messages you've been sending in thick and fast. Steve says, they're not British then. Get them deported to Gaza. I hate to tell you, but if you're born in this country or you've got British citizenship, you are British. I mean, I'm just saying, if you do support Hamas, though, well, go and live it. You, that's a fair point. John says, sadly, it's not a surprise. I think we have an enemy within. And Gary says, if they support a prescribed terrorist group, then they need to be removed from the UK immediately. I think the punishment would be a jail sentence, wouldn't it? I, mean, I don't know if we can jail that many people. But it is incredibly alarming. Half of the half of the hard left in this country seem to agree with them as well. Uh, you've also been getting in touch on the phones. Do keep those calls coming in. Let's go to Youssef, who is in Leicester. Hello, Youssef. Hi, to you. UK. Very well indeed. Thanks for joining us. What do, what do you make of this poll? You see, the poll is, the poll is if put this way, it depends who you ask. Right? The thing is, look, I think if we take all take a deep breath and look at the foundation of our very discussion should be the, how do we preserve life? That should be preservation of life on both sides, whether the Israeli, Palestinian. Yeah. And that, that, if we count that as a starting point and then work up what's from there, then we'll have a real proper discussion. Because, look, the thing is, if we just, if we just um, roll out um, certain narratives and things, what that does, that just infuriates the situation. For that's put petrol on fire. Well, hold on a minute, it hold on a minute. What you said at the beginning is lovely, but it's a bit kumbaya. Yeah, everyone wants to preserve life. However, you know, right, self-defence, people in Palestine, uh, the Hamas believing, you know, their land's been, you know, stolen from them, they've got a right to take that land back. People are going to have their beliefs. What do you make, though, of 46% of British Muslims, people living here, probably many of them born in this country, there's actually a higher preponderance of people who are younger in this country who believe that, so more likely to have been born here, second or third generation in this country, saying that they, they are sympathetic to a prescribed terrorist organisation that carried out rape and murder six months ago. See, the thing is, Julia, when you look at it in the full, full context of the discussion, you know, for decades this has been happening to the Palestinians. So any resistance or any... Um, is obviously, it a decade this condones. has been happening to the Palestinians? Have, have the IDF been going in raping and murdering and killing children? I mean... They've been, take, they've been taking prisoners. I mean, it's all documented. They've been taking prisoners, yes. They've been, they've been taking prisoners. They've been taking... Not only, you can say prisoners, they've just been taking... You can say hostages on one side because innocent people have been taken into Israeli prisons, thousands of them, even since the 7th of October. Yes. So the thing is, my, my point People is... People get look, taken it, captive by, by, by governments that are at war, but that's, that's different from taking innocent civilians hostage. You, you, are, you are refusing to answer my question for the second time, you said. What does... You know, that, what, what do you make of people in this country supporting a prescribed terrorist organisation? The, the thing is, Julia, like I said, because of um, they can't see any other solution right now to, to this, to this, because nobody. Wait, wait a second. You're say, well, no, no. You're saying the people in this country who are supportive of this, and it won't just be Muslims; it will be other people, you know, on the far left as well. You're saying they support this because there is no other solution. There is always no, another no, solution no. other than yes, but, but, killing and the, raping. The, the, the solution is a two-state solution. That's the way I look Hamas, at it. Hamas, I mean, but no, no. Hamas don't support a two-state solution. Yeah, nor does Netanyahu, and look what he's doing. The thing is, well, Netanyahu is a horrible to... man, but 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 yeah, Hamas but, but, don't yeah, support what... a two-state solution. No, so how? Why is... do these people support Hamas? 
the, the thing is, Julia, like I said, look, the, the thing is, right now, anything on the table to oppose Netanyahu, anybody will go with that. That's the, that's the bottom line. Regardless of what you call it, Hamas, you call it, um, what do you call it? You call it um, magic, what do you call it? Call it yes, sir, yes, sir. I'm, I don't mean to keep interrupting you, but I'm yeah. just trying to clarify. You're saying that people here and in Gaza and, and, other, and other Palestinian people around the Middle East, you're saying they will support any organisation, any actions of any organisation... Well, as long as they are anti-Netanyahu. You realise that no, most of the people no, in Israel not, not. don't support Netanyahu. Yeah, but what I'm saying, it's not about anti-Netanyahu, Julia. The point is, when people, when innocents are being killed on a daily basis, and it's not, it's not, it's not just, you know, um, it's not Hamas fighters that are being killed. It's, you know, it children, is Hamas fighters um, that are being break, killed break, break, as well. No but, when, no, but I'm saying the majority have been women and children. Well, no, that's the claim from the surely... Hamas-run health ministry. Given that half the population of Gaza is women and half the population of Gaza is also children, you're going to see a large number, and, and Hamas hides among the civilian population, you're going to see a large number of, tra tragically, of innocent civilians getting killed because that's Hamas's yeah, that's deliberate not, policy. Not... Yeah, but that's that's not an that's no excuse to kill innocent civilians. It's not an excuse Israeli to target army. them, but under international law, it is allowed. Actually, no, no. The, the thing but is, that's look, irrelevant. No, but I'm 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 I'm, 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 I'm still confused. With you. You're still saying you can un I, I, correct me if I'm wrong. You're saying you understand why such a large percentage of British Muslims support Hamas because there isn't any see. alternative. For, no, no, what I'm saying is that right, everybody supports the safety of innocent civilians. Yeah. Now, the thing is, as far as the UK is concerned, as far as the uh, US is concerned, if, you know, it doesn't seem, they don't seem to be answering anyone's call to, to a ceasefire for, for, you know, for months and months Sorry, and months. Who, who, right? How, so, how would we have a ceasefire if Hamas... Israel accepted the terms of the last ceasefire, which was agreed between, you know, people in Qatar and Egypt and the American CIA boss and others. It's Hamas that refused the terms. Hamas yeah, could have a ceasefire because... today, right now. I mean, literally, it's 11.35. They could just say, we're going to return the hostages, we lay down our weapons, ceasefire, job done. Yeah, but the thing is, that's only on Netanyahu's terms and his government's terms. It has to be, you know, you can't just say one-sided, we listen to whatever Netanyahu and his but, government say, and, that's, and, and we have to abide by it. But that's the whole no, point. You, you need to have both sides. It's Hamas that like, is refusing the ceasefire. Yeah, but because they, they, they don't, they, they're not agreeing to Hamas's terms as well. But my, my point is, I would agree with Hamas in the sense that IDF should vacate Gaza immediately first. But they weren't they in Gaza in, on October the 6th. They yeah, weren't the in Gaza is, they, until they, quite a few days yeah, after October the 7th. Yeah, but it's easy for us to say that, you know, um, Julia. No, but if it's we not easy for Gaza, us to say, it's a fact. If, if, they weren't. If, 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 we, if we lived in Gaza ourselves and under, under the same system as a Gazan population, mm -hmm. right, we would, we would probably be rebelling ourselves. Believe me, you know, the thing is, I've got, people, I've got friends in the I'd West be Bank. rebelling against Hamas, but then I'd probably be killed if I did that. <laughs> no, the thing... That, the, 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 the thing, the, the thing, the, the, the thing is, uh, this has been going on for decades. Uh, the things, even even before Hamas. But, but Hamas existed. isn't the solution. A, a Hamas murderous, Hamas genocidal organisation like Hamas no, no. isn't the solution. Hamas so is... why do so many British Muslims support Hamas when Hamas it, uses civilians all... as human shields? Why do you think all... that is? Well, first of all, I need to know. You need to explain to me who was asked and where they were asked. Where did this poll come from? First of all, you know, well, I've already said it's from the Henry Jackson things. Society. It's by a reputable poll yeah. company. They've, yeah, so they've, the, the, they've the, asked. The, they, they've polled all, Muslims yeah. across so, the so, country of so, a representative sample of Muslims so, by no, age and demographic. Julia, 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 that explains it all. Henry Jackson Society. Douglas Murray, etc., and, and they have always been anti-Muslim. Every single discussion they've had up to date has been They're totally anti Islamophobic. They are, they, they are an extremist far-right organisation. You look it up. They're yourself. not a far-right right organisation. Of course they are. They, 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 they are completely anti-Muslim. They're anti-extremism. Anti that... Everyone no, should no. be anti-Islamist extremism. Why do you say I... Islamic extremism? Any, any form of extremism endangers They're anti-extremism, but we're talking about Islamist extremism in Hamas. That's no, why I mentioned Islamists. The, what about the Netanyahu extremism? What about the Israeli extremism? Why, yeah. no, why don't do you, you say... Why, why do you mean... I don't like Netanyahu. Most of the people in Israel, by all accounts, according to polls, aren't keen on Netanyahu, but he is a democratically elected, under their system, um, a prime minister of their country. He may not and be so for also... very long. 
So, so was Hamas. So was, so was Hamas de democratic. Well, they democratic were elected. What was elected. it? Two thousand and five right? was the last election. Yes, ex exactly. But well, my point is, we're not saying we support Hamas. We we're supporting the safety of innocent civilians. No, that, no. Uh, that, the, the question right? was about: Do you do you sympathise with Hamas? No, but my point is, Julia, you don't listen to Henry Jackson Society. You, you can't have them the poll, on. You the poll have, was you carried you out by a reputable polling no, agency no, that, which used to work Henry in Number Jack 10 Downing Street. Henry Jackson Society, for that, that explains it you all. Don't get you, got, to, you, got... you don't get to write the poll or conduct the poll. You just commission the poll because they're interested to know what people think. Channel 4 no, but... conducted a similar poll after the 7-7 uh, attacks in 2005 and got remarkably similar results. Do you think Channel 4 uh, um, are a far-right uh, anti-Muslim organisation? Uh, look, Julia, really the thing is, as we talk today, Henry Jackson Society, that, 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 that's a no-go for me, believe me. That's a, that's a, I won't listen okay. to anything what they say. I'll have to I leave it I there. I don't, believe a, word, I don't believe a word they say. I'm out of time, but I really appreciate your call. Thank you for debating with me. I appreciate your, your getting on the show. Thank you for that. Uh, right, so let's come up uh, to a break, and we're going to be talking uh, about uh, Downing Street facing calls to take action against Tory MP William Bragg after he admitted betraying his colleagues in a honey trap sting. So why is everyone defending him? I'm Julia. Hartley Brewer, you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to ab and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of Cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat, oh. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, a trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you're right. laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. We're supposed to, her. We're supposed to was have another moved on from era. that. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV. Now, Downing Street is facing calls to take some action against Tory MP William Bragg after he admitted last week that he'd betrayed his colleagues by handing over MPs' phone numbers after being caught in a honey trap sting on a dating website. Joining me right now to discuss this is writer and a former clerk in the House of Commons, Elliot Wilson. A good morning to you. Thanks morning. for joining us in the studio. Sam Armstrong also still with us. Um, I was absolutely amazed when I saw this story. William Bragg, he's not a well-known MP, he's a, but he is a, he, not a front bencher, but he is a select committee Chairman, yes. So a senior, a senior figure in the party, um, he he's basically had to admit that he handed out phone numbers of a number of colleagues and including women colleagues, Andrew Jenkins among those, mm. uh, and political journalists to a complete, a completely unknown stranger who had contacted him via the dating gay dating website Grinder, um, and he basically they'd exchanged pictures, or he thought he'd exchanged pictures involving uh, rather compromising pictures. We understand of his naked. Nicked member, should we go with member this time? Um, and um, basically, the threat was if you don't give me numbers of your mm. colleagues, um, these are all going to be made public. So he just basically decided to throw his colleagues under the bus and had out the numbers. And then he eventually stopped and went to the authorities. He said he's, he feels terrible. He said, he said it, was the, you know, it was a terrible thing for him done. He, we're told he's been by Jeremy Hunt, no less than the Chancellor. He's been courageous and offered although not understanding what the word fulsome means, a full yeah. apology. Um, a lesson here is for all MPs, we're told they need to be very careful about cyber security uh, as well. Um, is that the lesson here? Well, I think that is a lesson, but it's a lesson that Mr Ragg could perhaps have learned several weeks ago and, and applied before he made a series of catastrophic misjudgments. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not particularly interested in starting a witch hunt against him, but it, it's very clear that he made a number of bad decisions, which he knew to be bad decisions when he was making them, and made them for... The initial sending of a photograph of your naked bits... Yes. ..to a complete stranger on a dating website when you are an elected MP and a select committee chair. Yeah. Uh-uh. Big mistake. And then the first request for a number of a colleague, once you gave that first number, that was the second. Very big mistake. Yes. But not just a mistake. I mean, he embarrassed himself and opened yes. himself up to well, ridicule, but also risk of blackmail. And we know the blackmail worked because he gave those numbers. But he also then exposed his colleagues. But we don't know whether this was extortion for money or whether this could have been uh, uh, an agent for a foreign government, an enemy government. No, I mean, there's a lot we don't know about it, and I'm sure that there are investigations going on. But it, it's very clear that he made poor and incorrect decisions. Um, I think it would probably be... It would certainly be reasonable for the party to suspend the whip from him. I'm slightly bemused that they seem almost to be digging in against doing that. I mean, he is um, standing down as an MP. He's standing down as an MP. They don't MP want anyway. to have another by-election that costs £150,000, yeah. and, you know... Is it, but he's still a select committee chair. He hasn't even had the decency to stand down from that I, role. I would be interested to see if that lasts until Parliament comes back next week. I, I don't think he will find that he can really be an effective select committee chair for very much longer. And I think his, his colleagues will obviously treat him in a, in a very different way, as you would expect. But, but he has been treated very differently than I think other people who would have done something like this. I mean, I, Sam and I were discussing earlier, it seems to me that there's been a playing of two cards. One is, he's gay. Like, I don't know what difference that makes, other than that maybe, I don't know, maybe other men want to see naked pictures of men's todgers. I know women don't want to. Guys, trust me, we don't want to. Um, uh, and, 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 and also that he's having some mental health issues. But I don't see why that's a get-out-of-jail-free card for someone who has committed such treachery against his colleagues and political journalists who were also, whose numbers were also given away, but also could have committed treachery against his own government. Because we know how foreign spies operate. You get somebody, you get in, right, we've got the numbers from him, he's now, we're now blackmailing him, and now we'll get to someone else, and that person, and that person, and then eventually we'll get somebody in government who's stupid enough to do this. At that point, we've got someone who's going to give us information about what's happening in Cabinet. This is incredibly serious stuff. And everyone seems to have gone, oh, poor William Bragg, what a victim. He wasn't a victim. Well, he was the villain. I, I think it's a, a set of circumstances in which several things can, all, can be true at the same time. Um, clearly, he has acted badly, inappropriately, foolishly, unwisely, whatever you want to call it, and he must bear the responsibility for that. And I think that responsibility should include, you know, uh, stepping away from the, the select committee that he chairs and, and perhaps losing the party whip. One can equally say he may be having difficulties with his mental health and one may even feel personally sorry for him, but those don't invalidate the no. fact that he is made mistakes for which he must 
carry the can, ultimately. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And in terms of sort of the mistakes that we know a lot of MPs do make, um, and I'm still amazed the number of MPs who are in WhatsApp groups where things always get leaked, is it? I mean, MPs, though, get an awful lot of advice now on cyber security. Yes. You were a clerk in the House of Commons. What yeah. sort of things are they warned about? Oh, I mean... Exactly this, I'm assuming. Yes, you know, there is a huge amount of advice available from the Parliamentary Security Department. Um, they will be told what they should do, what they shouldn't do, best practice and all that kind of stuff. The, the difficulty is that... Does you it include explicitly saying... Do not send pictures of your naked penis to people. I, I think it will come fairly close to being that clear, yes, because I think, you know, these things are usually laid out for uh, for the, the slowest learner in the convoy, if you like. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yes, it will have been made very clear. And I think it's also worth pointing out that there's no suggestion that Mr Rag didn't know that what he was doing would have consequences. It, it, exactly. That's the crucial thing there. Um, Elliot Wilson, thank you very much. Really brief word from Sam Armstrong on this. Do you think, do you think he's going to lose the, uh, the, the chairmanship of that select committee? I, I really hope so. He's meant to be judging the proper uh, conduct of government. And yeah. clearly, if he hasn't got that level of... Uh, common sense, I, I struggle to understand how he can be an effective questioner on behalf of the British people. Absolutely, absolutely. I couldn't, couldn't agree with you more. Thank you very much, gents. Very much appreciate that. Coming up after the break, Pfizer is accused of making misleading claims over its COVID vaccine by the UK's pharmaceutical watchdog and Labour say no more money for the NHS unless it's reformed. I'm Julia Hartley-Brewer, you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think but, like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're yeah, supposed it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV. Now, Pfizer is accused of making misleading claims over its COVID vaccine by the UK's pharmaceutical watchdog. They say that Pfizer has discredited the industry. This, as the uh, Shadow Health Secretary, Wes Streeting, has said today in an interview with The Sun that there will be no extra funding for the NHS under a Labour government without the, what he calls, major surgery of reform. Well, let's talk about both these subjects with Carl Hennigan, who's Professor of Evidence-Based Medicine at the University of Oxford. Good morning to you, Carl. Good morning, Julia. Thanks for joining us. Well, I mean, look, this, you know, COVID, once again, we're talking about it, COVID inquiry, of course, ongoing. Will we ever get to the bottom of lots of decisions? But this is, I mean, this is extraordinary because this is actually a ruling by the pharmaceutical watchdog um, about Pfizer, particularly their senior executives, using social media back in 2020, before the formal licensing of their COVID vaccine, to say basically it's brilliant and make loads of claims about it that simply weren't true and they've finally been wrapped over the knuckles for it. Is this a little bit too late, too little? Well, yeah, what's happened here is that a senior executive in Pfizer in the UK tweeted a study about the conclusions prior to marketing approval and that's a breach by promoting an unlicensed medicine. You can't do that. It's, it's if you do that, you're breaking the law. You can get a fine or you can actually get imprisonment. What's interesting about, though, is the derisory fine that actually Pfizer received. It was £34,800. Now, to put that into context, in 2021, on the back of the vaccines, Pfizer earned in excess of £81 billion in revenues. So the fine is roughly about 17 seconds worth of those revenues. Yeah. It's like asking you to say, Julia, broke the law, it'll cost you one pence. Yeah. Now, the thing is, this is not unusual because Pfizer has had six breaches throughout the COVID pandemic. And it was only in November 2022 when their chief executive was promoting childhood vaccines and actually giving information that was m misleading. And for that, he was also seen to be in breach of the code. So the problem here is what's called the Prescriptions Medicines Code of Practice Authority is a self-regulatory body. It sort of gives you a little slap on the wrist, mm. but it certainly does nothing to stop the practice. And what we've seen is the company comes out and the executive in the UK said it was unintentional and accidental. Nothing about the way the industry operates is that <laughs> unintentional yeah. and accidental. This is about getting out there the information in a world where the amount of money to be made is huge. Yeah, and indeed it's very noticeable, you know, from AstraZeneca, of course that was you know, funded by the government, some of that research, and, and they weren't making the profit on it, whereas other, other uh, pharmaceutical companies made a fortune. It was interesting, wasn't it? We went from believing that, uh, you know, pharmaceutical companies were, who again and again had put drugs on the market, which they were lying about the results and the testing, which caused, you know, a, a massive big cover-ups of, of the injuries they were causing, to suddenly believing every single thing that these wonderful angelic organisations were doing um, and not paying full attention. Do you still think that we need to have some sort of investigation into vaccine harms in this country? There's still con concerns about excess deaths. Do we need to have some proper acknowledgement of this? Yeah, so there are two different things here going on. The first is, Julia, you're right. There seems to be becoming no-go areas where if you criticise or ask questions, COVID vaccines are one of them, transgender and the treatment of children has been one of them, and that's a real issue. If you can't be critical and in being critical, ask important questions, how are we ever to learn what the truth is? The second issue is there's been a noticeable increase in excess deaths from about mid-21, 22 onwards. And in doing so, we've asked for investigations time and time again, but the country, the UK, brushes it off. It's noticeable that actually the Australian Senate is the first country to break rank and says, we are going to investigate and look at excess deaths. I also think with this issue, there's a real need to look at the safety and the regulator, start to ask questions of the MHRA, because it's certainly a problem with safety reporting. We have a yellow card system that nobody knows exists hardly, but should be reporting all the time the adverse events, and there are still lots of unknowns. So I think we need a root and branch approach to how we look at excess deaths and how we look at safety. Absolutely. Now, look, I've left far too little time, and I do apologise that I took a caller mm -hmm. for a long time a little bit earlier. But um, Wes Street, the Labour Shadow Health Secretary, wants to be Health Secretary in a few months' time, has warned the NHS there'll be no additional funding without what he calls major surgery under Labour. Do you think an awful lot of the, the health workers, a lot of health unions, are going to be rather surprised and disappointed by uh, Labour getting in? Because they think that's the answer to all their problems with the NHS. Do you think that's not the case? 
Well, look, there are systemic problems now in the NHS that need an overhaul. I agree with that. Number one is particularly the waiting list. I mean, 7.8 million, but the Telegraph reported it could be 10 and the Times said it could be 11 million. Bear in mind, you, you so still work real... in, in, in a hospital yeah. as well. You're not I'm just off in academia. In, yeah. I can tell you there are structural problems in the NHS that are real issues. The most important problem is is how do we get doctors in front of people? When you get in front of a doctor, the service is world-class, but there are structural issues. The key here though is I think is what's the role of government and then what's the role of who's in charge? Because whoever's in charge of the NHS should be accountable for all these failings. Is it the government or is it NHS England? Okay. And I exactly. think we need to separate those two issues out and Absolutely. come to a conclusion of what's the role of the government and the NHS. Absolutely. England. Thank you very much, Carl Hennigan. Really appreciate that. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV. Very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <it's here. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Okay. That's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just for yeah. minute, for... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. We're yeah, supposed to have was moved another on from era. that. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon, welcome to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer, you're with Talk TV. We're on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. And I'm with you live from 10 until 1. Coming up in this hour, Israeli forces have largely withdrawn from southern Gaza. The move comes six months after the Hamas attacks on October the 7th, as Israel and Hamas both sent delegations to Cairo to join fresh ceasefire negotiations. Meanwhile, the government is under pressure to publish the legal advice to ministers over Israel's compliance with international law, as calls for a suspension of British arms exports grows. And the 
landmark cast review to be published this week will say that transgender children face grave psychological consequences if they're allowed to socially transition at school. All that, plenty more coming up. First, though, let's get the latest news headlines with Jay Akbar. Good morning. Israel has withdrawn almost all its troops from southern Gaza, leading to hopes that more humanitarian aid can safely reach civilians. Officials believe the IDF has reduced its numbers in the region so they can regroup before targeting Rafah, where hundreds of thousands are sheltering. Yesterday, British Foreign Secretary Lord Cameron said UK support for Israel is not unconditional after an Israeli attack on an aid convoy left seven people dead. The former chair of the Defence Select Committee, Tobias Elwood, told Talk today the situation is becoming even more complex. So the question is, if we actually did impose um, uh, some form of sanctions or freeze our arms sales, would we yield later, a greater influence or not? And that is the concern we have separate as to whether international law has been breached or not. Very, very difficult questions requiring a lot of statecraft at this moment. A major manhunt continues after a 27-year-old mum was stabbed and killed while pushing her baby in a pram in Bradford. Police say Habiba Massum is wanted over the attack and he's well known to the victim, but they won't confirm how. Former Detective Superintendent Shabnam Chowdhury told Talk today there will be great urgency to track him down. One day may not seem a lot of time to many people, but in the life of a murder investigation, that's a significant amount of loss of evidence and the golden hours, which are really crucial at this time. The police will be looking at CCTV, any digital footprint that he may have left behind in terms of where he's gone. Chaos continues across the rail network this morning, with train drivers walking off the job in their third day of major strike action over pay and working conditions. Staff at 16 train companies are taking part, causing cancellations, delays or no service at all to some areas. Passengers who spoke with Talk TV had mixed views. Been going on for two years, they need to sort it out. I don't know how they can sort that out, but they need to. We put up with these train strikes for ages, they need their money. I'm really pleased because I don't have to go to work. They need to end, actually. Yeah. Why? Because the trains are integral to all of our lives, you know. Absolutely, I'm behind them as long as it takes. So, the people have had their wages stripped back, they're not allowed to claim overtime anymore, they're expected to work on Sundays, their holidays have been changed, their job security has been changed. You know, what do they expect to do? Sit there and take it? Boeing is under investigation after a plane part fell off during takeoff yesterday in the US. The Southwest flight was departing from Denver with 135 passengers on board when an engine cowling detached. It managed to turn back and land safely. It does follow other manufacturing and safety concerns at Boeing. Stargazers here will get to enjoy part of North America's total solar eclipse tonight. If you live in western parts of the UK, look up just before sunset. You should see a partial eclipse where the moon is covering a small portion of the sun. And move aside Jurassic Park. A US company believes it could bring prehistoric creatures back to life. Colossal Biosciences is working on reintroducing species like the mammoth and the dodo within four years. The firm's boss says they have all the technology they need and will use artificial intelligence to replicate their genes in their closest living relatives. That's the latest from me. Now time for the weather with Nazni and Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello. We're still looking at rather unsettled conditions for today and, in fact, for this week. Today, it's a, in the form of a named storm by Meteor France that is bringing wet weather across many northern and western parts of England and Wales. And later this afternoon and into tonight, there will be a bunch of showers moving northwards over central, southern and eastern areas. But for many parts of central northern Scotland, it will be mostly fine and bright. Northern Ireland, though, will see some rain through this afternoon. And overnight, the winds will strengthen down towards the southwest 
with gusts up to around 70 miles per hour. There is a warning from the Met Office for that. And the rain continues its journey further northwards up towards Scotland and northern England, where there is a warning for the south and east of Scotland, as there could be the risk of localised flooding from the rains there. Elsewhere, mostly dry and uh, clear with uh, rather cool conditions compared to the last few nights. But there will be lots of showers across the parts of the Midlands, central and eastern England that will continue there through tomorrow. The rain will also continue across much of Scotland, some of it turning wintry across the Highlands, and there will be rain across parts of Wales, easing later across southern areas in the south. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good afternoon. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley. You are with Talk TV. Still with me in the studio is commentator Sam Armstrong. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, lots more guests to get to, lots of big subjects. Um, I just want to remind everyone the question we're asking you about today, which relates, of course, to the six-month anniversary yesterday of the uh, horrific Hamas attacks on Israel. And, of course, we've got lots of developments we're going to talk about in a few minutes' time about what's happening in Israel and Gaza. But a new poll that was carried out says that uh, almost half of British Muslims said they sympathise with Hamas. 46% said they sympathise with Hamas. And astonishingly, 24% of British Muslims in this country, and the poll was carried out of British Muslims and also of the wider British society to com compare and contrast, but 24% of Muslims in this country uh, said uh, that they do not believe that uh, Hamas carried out rape or murder or other atrocities on October the 7th. I just want to know your reaction is to this. Give us a call, 0344 499 1000, text 8722, or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Calls are charged at the national rate. Text costs one standard network rate message. Um, Sam, we've talked an awful lot about that, and we will come back to that in a few moments' time. I want to ask you about uh, uh, just a couple of other stories. Um, we've got a manhunt in Bradford after a knife man, Habib Masum, is the uh, suspect. Um, it's his second day now of the manhunt after a 27 year old uh, woman was uh, stabbed to death um, uh, with, uh, with, with, when she was with um, a, a buggy with her baby in. Um, broad daylight in a shopping area by the, a man and the suspect they, the police are searching for is this knife man, Habib uh, Masum, who's believed to be, um, well, on the run. Um, he was someone who was here uh, as a student uh, studying a master's according to his LinkedIn profile, in digital marketing at the University of Bedfordshire. Um, he is from Bangladesh uh, and, uh, and, is, and, as I say, is a student and a married man. It is believed, we're told by the police, that these two people knew each other. It has a lot of echoes, this story, of the horrific you know, acid attack or alkali attack in Clapham Common, doesn't it? This is a heinous crime by somebody that is in this country on a student visa, quite why the University of Bedfordshire, one of this country's lowest performing universities, needs to hand out student visas to bring over people from Bangladesh to study... Masters in digital... Is Can he get a masters in digital marketing? Does it come with Mickey Mouse on the certificate? And, and then he's in this country living seemingly an awful long way away from Bedfordshire, and the police now having been chasing after him after he's committed a heinous crime. Well, he's, no, he's alleged to have committed a heinous crime. Forgive me. We, we, need to alleged, be very, very alleged to have we, we have due process in this uh, country. Alleged to have committed a heinous crime. They've put out a picture with that they say is copyright to them that looks an awful lot to me like it might be a mugshot. Now, why Yorkshire Police, West Yorkshire Police, have a mugshot of this man already, I don't know, but I we, guess yeah, we can we, hazard a guess. We, we, we don't know for but sure. But if it is, if it is but, that, there will be serious, serious questions. And it is an if about why, yet again, we have somebody in this country that is here on a temporary student visa committing horrendous crimes that will make... Allegedly. The, the, allegedly <laughs> committing horrendous crimes that will make the entire community of Bradford feel absolutely well, and, and terrified. It's interesting, local council is saying, that, you know, they believe this, this woman was known to the alleged attacker and... And and therefore they, they wasn't a random, you know, just attacking a woman with a buggy. As if as if that makes it less terrifying for people. It's, it's a bit a bit a very big concern. There's one other story I want I want. I mean, we'll see what happens where, if and when this this man is is found, if and when he does he is the he is the uh, suspect they were looking for, and if and when he's charged and or uh, he he is he is found guilty of this, uh, if that is the case. Can I also ask you just about another story? 
apropos of nothing, not, not, not related to this at all, but two front pages today on the Mirror and the Sun, two of the biggest selling newspapers in this country, both got stories about cosmetic surgery in Turkey. A lot of people want to have cosmetic surgery now, a lot of people getting their teeth done, uh, spending thousands of pounds, weirdly having their teeth sort of basically chiseled off and then replaced with veneers. I mean, it absolutely fills me with horror. Um, but, um, uh, these two different stories. One suggested you can actually get cheaper vets bills in Turkey on the front of the mirror. So you can basically go, they do a deal. You can get a nose job for you and get your pet treated. I kid you not. Um, but also, as the Sun front page, looking at basically nose jobs in Turkey being basically the deals are being done and money exchanged in hotels in the UK and then you go over. But we know that these are, a lot of these operations are not carried out under the same high standards, cleanliness and skill level that you would expect in the UK. And then there are repercussions. We've seen women dying from getting a bum lift. I'm kind of the view if you get a bum lift, you, you probably brought, I mean, I'm sorry, I've not got much sympathy, but, but you know, lot, men and women are getting horrific surgery, coming back with major problems. And of course, it's the NHS that has to pick up the pieces. What do you make of this? Yeah, look, I, I know of people that have gone out to Turkey and had their hair done. Do or, you? And ah. the rest of it. And look, sometimes it works, but sometimes it really doesn't work. And I think I, where I come out on this is as such, go out there, if you want to get it done for a thousand pounds less, good for you. But if you come back and it all goes wrong, you've got to pay your own NHS treatment. That's, that's the deal. You've got to pay for the aftercare too. I'm not having the taxpayer have to pick that up for you because you wanted to save 350 quid and get, get a two weeks well, on the beach while you're there. Not cheap. And what do you make? We, we didn't get to come back to you just for the top of the hour when we were speaking to Carl Hennigan. Wes Street in the uh, Shadow Health Secretary. Uh, he likely could be Health Secretary by the end of this year. You're saying 100%, you know, he, the Labour will be winning the election that um, he's basically done an interview with the Sun newspaper saying, <laughs> look, you know, there isn't going to be any more money for the NHS. The extra, there's a billion or so they're going to give certain things. That is conditional on massive reform of the NHS. Do you think that actually Labour are serious about this? We're treating as someone who's himself has undergone cancer treatment in recent years. He's been, you know, the, the sharp end of the health service. He strikes me as someone who really does get that the NHS isn't just... It's not, you know, it's not a funding issue anymore. It's a system issue that is the problem with all of our huge waiting lists. I mean, I hope so. I probably don't agree with West Streeting on much, but he's a very impressive character to watch, certainly on the media. That's, that doesn't always translate to being able to run a department well. But there is this old rule in politics sometimes that actually Labour is the only party that can do NHS reform because the Tory party are so terrified of touching it for fear of the allegations from the 24 unions. hours to save the NHS is what we're going to be told before the next election. It, etc. That they, that they haven't done stuff. And you cannot look at the last 14 years of uh, conservative rule of the NHS and let's not forget more money in it than ever before but worse and worse outcomes and think the Tory lower party, productivity lower productivity poorer outcomes people are waiting longer than ever before to get basic surgery Just and, understand. We're, we're spending a fortune we're spending similar sums to other countries in Western Europe actually now uh, and, and and yet and yet we, we, we we're waiting for longer these waiting lists that we talk about as routine they simply don't exist in other countries. And West Streeting seems to be ignoring some of the usual Labour shibboleths. He was talking today about using the private sector where it makes yeah. sense. So, look, I'm really, really help, uh, hopeful because, look, we all rely on the NHS. Even if you use private stuff, more people using the NHS means it's cheaper to go private. Yeah. So I really hope he does uh, succeed okay. in doing that. Great stuff. Thank great to hear your thoughts on all of that. Thank you very much indeed, Sam Armstrong. More from him in just a few moments. Moving on now, though, let's go back to what's going on in Israel and Gaza. And indeed, impact back home. Israeli forces have largely withdrawn from southern Gaza. The move comes six months after the Hamas attacks on October the 7th, uh, marked yesterday, as Israel and Hamas have both now sent delegations to Cairo to join fresh ceasefire negotiations. Some are getting hopeful. But uh, does that have an impact on whether or not we should still be selling arms to Israel? And indeed, that extraordinary poll we've seen uh, suggesting that an extraordinarily large number of Muslims in this country support Hamas. Joining me right now to discuss all of this is co-founder of Navarra Media, Aaron Bastani. Good afternoon to you, Aaron. Hi, Julia. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, first of all, um, in terms of the IDF withdrawing from southern Gaza, um, you've been writing a lot about this and talking a lot about this in recent months. Um, more aid getting in, um, more aid getting in certainly absolutely vital for civilians who, who have been left. Uh, I mean, we know people are starving uh, as a massive big issue with the aid getting in. But with these negotiations starting in Cairo, both representatives of both sides going in, are you in any way more hopeful today than perhaps you might have been on Friday that we can see an end to uh, this war? I think hopeful is a strong word when you've had so much death on both sides. Um, I'm, 
I'm, I'm optimistic in so much as I think as some kind of political solution is ultimately inevitable. And that does seem now to have dawned on, on the Israeli side. I mean, many Israelis I speak to, liberal Zionists, are perfectly clear that they think that Netanyahu is not the man to solve this. And there's building political pressure for him too. If you look at the domestic Israeli press, uh, the Jerusalem Post, for instance, Haaretz, they really do have the knives out right now for the country's political leadership. So I think that twin dynamic of pressure on Netanyahu, potentially even maybe another government, although I think that is unlikely in the short term, and the necessity for a political solution, uh, that does make me optimistic, that, that dynamic. And, and Netanyahu is a political creature. He, he will recognise, I think, you know, the inevitability now of some kind of political solution, particularly given the pressure coming from the United States. Well, People I was like going Nancy to say, Pelosi. a lot of this seemed to follow a phone call with Joe Biden, US President. We know there's no love lost between those two men uh, and, and the pressure. But there's also pressure coming from the UK as well. We've had David Cameron, our foreign secretary, um, I mean, basically sort of wagging his finger, saying, you know, our support is, is, is you know, is not unconditional. The same with America. Do you think that has focused minds? 100%. I mean, the UK exports of weapons to Israel are, are tiny. It's only about 1% of um, less Israeli imports well of weapons, less I believe. That. Yeah, I mean, we do help service their F-35s, but apart from that, there's no real impact of, of, of the UK. It would be purely symbolic, and symbolism can matter, but it would be purely symbolic. With regards to the United States, it's a very different um, kettle of fish. You've got, obviously, the ongoing $14 billion aid deal between the US and Israel. Also, the Israelis are presently looking at, I think, an $18 billion deal to procure weapons, including F-15 fighter jets. So any kind of spanner in the works to that is a major problem for the Israeli military establishment. And whatever you see from the politicians, Ben Gavir, Smotrich, even Netanyahu, people at the top of the IDF, they think fundamentally in different ways. They are prone to long-termism in a way that elected politicians aren't. I mean, that's the case in countries right around the world. So I think, yes, the pressure coming from the US, particularly the statement from Nancy Pelosi recently, former um, former most senior Democrat in the, in the House of Congress, um, saying that she doesn't support or she would like to see a suspension of US arms sales to Israel. Utterly extraordinary. I don't think anybody thought they could ever no, but predict we, that. And we, know, and we know why a lot of that pressure has happened. A lot of this about is homegrown views, and again, on the left, but also among uh, growing Muslim communities in, in the West, in, in America and Britain. What do you make of the demands? We've seen a letter recently for us to stop from senior uh, you know, Supreme Court, former Supreme Court judges and other lawyers uh, calling for the UK to suspend arms sales uh, to Israel, such as they are. It's, they're absolutely tiny. It's actually less than 0.1%, for goodness sake. It's not significant, but it is symbolic and it does send a message about the West's support for Israel. We've seen another letter actually since found by even more top legal minds saying the exact opposite. There isn't a, 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 a legal argument under international law for us to do that. But what message does it send out while Israel are in a battle with you know, a prescribed terrorist organisation, Hamas, that is using civilians in the way it is after just six months after that horrific massacre on October the 7th? What message would it send out, even symbolically, if Britain did say, we won't send you any arms, we are cutting you off um, to make a statement to the world? Does that not give succour to the terrorists of Hamas? Well, I think, you know, this has really gained traction in the UK after three UK nationals were killed by the IDF. I personally cannot understand why anybody would oppose a, a suspension of weapons sales to Israel, even if just for a month. I, I, you know, well, I find well, it absolutely... Well, well, I, I, well, I do. I oppose the I oppose suspension. In, 18, in, 18, in 1847, there was a UK national whose house was burglarised in Athens. As a response, Palmerston, who was then the Foreign Secretary, ordered a blockade of the Athenian harbour for two months until he was compensated by the Greek government. Okay. Today, in 2024, we can have three UK nationals killed, no actual explanation given. And there hasn't been an explanation, Julia, given. And, and we do nothing. And I think, in that case, if you're not even going to do the symbolism when three of your people die, I, I do find that but, somewhat extraordinary. But that, depends, that whether... depends on whether or not we believe that the Israeli government went, yeah, there are three British nationals among other foreign workers, uh, aid workers, let's target them because of that and we'll just do that because we can. I don't think anyone thinks that the Israeli armed forces, whether they think they are evil or acting for good, are stupid. Now, it was a, they said it was a mistake. They have apologised, including the president. I mean, you know, this has been a disaster for them awful to think about PR when we're talking about human lives lost, So, but it's obviously not as important, but it has been a disaster for them internationally. There's no reason why they would have done this deliberately 
callously and carelessly, this is a horrible mistake. We make mistakes in war. British forces have done that. American forces have done that. All forces do that. Why are we holding Israel to a higher account? Well, I mean, the, the paper of record in Israel, Haaretz, would disagree with your analysis there. They were quite clear that the reason why this happened is because the IDF have operationally lost any control on the ground. That's Haaretz quoting an IDF source. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sort of alleging this because it's something I'd like to believe. It's literally something that's being said in the Israeli press. You know, there, there are of plenty mistakes. of people in Israel, in the media in Israel, in the politics in Israel that oppose a lot of what the Netanyahu government is doing and the IDF forces. We know that. But that doesn't well, make it true. Well, we, I'm quoting... I mean, I don't know what else I can do other than quote an Israeli news source. And what I would say is, if you put the, if you put the boot on the other foot, if UK armed forces killed, you know, three Israeli nationals... I'm pretty sure Netanyahu would have responded in an incredibly aggressive, assertive way. I think, you know, our ambassador would have uh, would have been kicked out of Tel Aviv by tea time. So, like I say, it I depends think whether we thought it was deliberate or not. Now, that's the key thing. It depends right. whether we thought it was. De this is the key thing. It's, but anyway, in terms of where we are now, where we go. A lot of people would argue we, they want a negotiated settlement. You said there's going to be a political settlement to this. Undoubtedly, they will be some sort of settlement of some sort. I'm not sure how, where it comes from, though, when we, we know well, Netanyahu's not really in favour of a two-state solution, but we know for a fact that Hamas aren't in favour of a two-state solution. Let me also ask you, though, about this extraordinary poll carried out by the Henry Jackson Society. It was a, a, a poll which um, shows, I mean, frankly, I think shocking, shocking support uh, for Hamas in this country. I'm still quite shocked, actually, by the wider population in terms of the figures on this, uh, uh, on these figures. But one, just one in four British Muslims, according to this poll, carried out by a JL Partners, that used to be the former Downing Street uh, uh, polling uh, pollsters, one in four British Muslims believe that Hamas committed murder and rape in Israel on October the 7th. Uh, the others don't or don't know. That's um, um, sh much, much lower than the, the average Britain. Although, I like to say the average Britain, it's still only in the 60s, which I still find terrifying. But even more shockingly, 46% of British Muslims said they sympathise with Hamas. Um, what's your reaction to that? Yeah, it was a really interesting poll. There was also a, a question about um, should it be prohibited to, you know, have a, have an image of, of the Prophet Muhammad. Obviously, it shouldn't be prohibited. That's absurd. A, a third. Um, a, might... Was it a third or yeah. so? No apologies. No, over yeah. half. 52% of British Muslims yeah. wanted to be illegal in this country to show a picture of Prophet Muhammad. That's compared to just 16% of the public. Also, a third would like to see Sharia law implemented in the UK. What, what do you make of all of those results? Yeah. Well, I, the Sharia law thing, I mean, it's just obviously silly. UK law should be applied in the UK. In terms of the Prophet Muhammad, I think, obviously, it's, it's ridiculous. I, I don't go out of my way to offend anybody. But clearly, you shouldn't be prohibiting an image. I think that's just nonsensical. It runs completely counter to the best traditions of this country. I would say, and I know it's something that people on the right disagree with, I think this is why we need a codified constitution enshrining freedom of speech, enshrining freedom of political conscience. Come, come. And like the United States, it should be a small document taught to all kids. It can fit in your pocket. And if somebody says something as stupid and moronic as that, you can say, you well, can well look, it. here's our constitution. I, if you I don't would, like it, leave. I would agree with you on all of that. But what do you make of the idea that... The, the, the a large, large minority, 46% of British Muslims, almost half of people living in this country, many of whom, and it's this more preponderance of this among younger and, weirdly, among higher educated Muslims in this country, so large people who've been brought up in this country, second or third generation uh, Muslims in this country, or maybe even longer, um, that they sympathise with a prescribed terrorist organisation, Hamas, that committed the atrocities they committed, undoubtedly, on the 7th of October. What does that tell us, and what do we need to do about it? Well, it's obviously a very shocking statistic. Um, and I think the problem is that many people sympathise with what's going on in Gaza. They, they sympathise with the fact that 13,000 children have been killed. Um, and you can choose to blame who you like, but that's, that's happened. And I think people are shocked by that and they, and they want to express that sympathy. Of course, it's wrong to, it's wrong to then say, well, I, I support Hamas, right? You know, I don't think they did anything wrong on October the 7th. Uh, that's obviously wrong. And I think really it boils down to having a much better, more healthy media conversation in this country, which, to be, to be fair to your channel, with, with Piers Morgan, when he was having people who completely disagreed coming on, there are a few exceptions which I wasn't a fan of, but by and large, I thought that was really positive. And I think that's what you need more of. I think people need to be confronted with opinions they don't necessarily agree with. That applies to all communities, colours and creeds. 
the, 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 the statistic, that particular data point in itself is absolutely shocking. And I, like I say, I think but what do a we, few what do we, what I mean, yes, we need to talk about it. We, if we don't know the extent of the problem, that there are people in this country, and again, I would say a large percentage of, of non-Muslims as well who appear to hold that view, certainly on the hard left, that if people hold those views, we can't tackle it unless we know it actually exists, and then we should tackle it. I'm, I don't want censorship. I think you always tackle people's bad ideas or misinformed ideas by actually confronting and talking about it publicly. But how do we, how do we get to a point when... No one in this country supports a prescribed terrorist organisation or has sympathy for them. Well, I think I think I, I, know, I think that's a strange way to look at it. So, for instance, if, if you were having what about from somebody who did think that, they might say, Julia, well, you're supporting the IDF and they're responsible for thousands of children being killed. In terms of the government has decided this organisation is prescribed, therefore nobody should have X opinions on it. I'm not so sure about that. I think there's just a basic sort of benchmark with regards to human decency, where if there's a war crime committed, as is the case on October 7th, Hamas committed a war crime, um, that should obviously not be supported by anything but a tiny minority of the country. And I, I do go back to my original answer, Julia. I do think we need a fundamental rethink about citizenship, having a written constitution, teaching people the importance yep. of freedom of speech and debate and dialogue and being able to change your mind. Because I, I think that really is the principal problem. No, very interesting point. Uh, Aaron Bastani, really appreciate you joining us. Uh, for founder of Novara <laughs> Media, thank you for that. Uh, still with me is Sam Armstrong. I'm, I'm massively in favour of a written constitution to protect our, you know, our, our rights to freedom of speech in the, in the face of people like Humza Yusuf in, uh, in Scotland, for instance. But... Um, he said, look, he's shocked by those, you know, the, the, those views, but how do we tackle it? Yeah, well, Aaron Bassani, you know, don't agree with much of what he says, but he's one of the more thoughtful people on the left. And actually, I, I'm with him and I'm with you that we lack a First Amendment in this country that just puts beyond any doubt whatsoever, puts beyond the scope of politics, that you can say what you like. I mean, we used to have it as a sort of ancient liberty, but sadly, that was eroded by Tony Blair and his... Yeah. But also, you can, have, you can have it written down, but at the end of the day, if, like, you're the Batley Grammar School teacher and you show a picture of the Prophet Muhammad in a class... Um, uh, to, to and, and then people uh, basically you know, threaten you with, uh, to, with death and your family and you have to go into hiding for three or four years. With all due respect, I mean, you can have anything you want written down in law if it's not backed by physical force of the law. It's no sodding use to you. Yeah, an utter disgrace. And we spend... I wouldn't show a picture of the Prophet Muhammad. Spend... I wouldn't do that on air. You know why? Because I would be killed, my husband and daughter would be killed, the production team would face death threats, and, because we know that's what happened to Charlie Hebdo. This, but I don't. But I think I should have the right to do it. But having that law in place ain't going to make any difference to me. We had four years, and Sarah Khan, the counter extremism commissioner, came up with this report into what went on at Batley Grammar School. What was her chief recommendation? Oh, we need to ban protest outside yeah. schools. Brilliant. No, send in the troops. Okay, Eisenhower. I, we, we say we, we laugh at this, but Eisenhower, of course, remember, sent in the troops to, to desegregate schools in yeah. the South. There was a time in this country where we we thought, you know, we stand up for principles, no matter what, we fight for them, yeah. and that's going to be. I, it. I hate it when Emmanuel Macron as being a stronger leader on a lot of these issues than our own uh, uh, Prime Minister and, and other leaders. Thank you very much. More from Sam Armstrong throughout the show. Uh, now, I'm asking about this new poll which says almost half of British Muslims that they sympathise with Hamas. What is your reaction? Please give us a call, 0344 499 text 8722. Get in touch on X at Talk TV as well. Jenny says, I'm not in the least bit surprised. Caroline says, and people wonder why anti-Semitism is on the rise in this country. And Nicholas says, I would have thought it was higher, if I'm honest. Not surprised at this one bit. You've also been getting in touch on the phones. Do keep those calls coming in. Let's go to Jill, who's in Cornwall. Hello, Jill. Well, good morning to good you, morning. Julia. After, after late night for Jill. It's, it's oh, afternoon yeah. now. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Listening to all this, um, do you know, it really bothers me when I hear people with a voice with, who are able to have a voice in this country, some of the things that they come out with. You know, I, 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 where is the culture of this country going? Where, where has it yeah. gone? You know, when, when it's all right for someone to stand up and say that, um, you know, people who support Hamas should have a voice. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about a terrorist organisation. Yeah. You know, forget anything else. They are terrorists. Yeah. I mean, they, they, and they've they, openly they, admitted doing a lot of things that apparently a large number of people in this country, both Muslim and non-Muslim, don't think they actually did, even though they put out the images themselves on Telegram. I mean, this was well-documented and objective truth about what they did on October the 7th. 
Uh, the, the thing is, the Israelis could have, could have denied the deaths, the cause of the deaths of those three um, charity workers. They could have turned around and said it wasn't them. But the fact that they admitted that they'd made a mistake and this had happened. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, this is a war we're talking about. It's, it's a war. And there is nothing on the bombs and the bullets that say this will kill so-and-so, but it won't kill such-and-such. Such. It, it, it will happen. People will die who don't, shouldn't die, but they will yeah. die because it's a war. And yeah. I'm sorry, but I'm really bothered by the fact that 46% of British Muslims, I can't get it out of my head what that university professor said that day. It's stuck with me ever since that um, this country will be ruled by Muslims, whether we like it or not. Yeah, and see, I don't like it. When, when people talk like that, I was but when you look at the demographics, again, it's very important. I mean, I couldn't care less what faith people have, and I'm an, I'm an atheist. Yeah. I don't care whether you're, you know, Muslim, Jewish, C of E, whatever. I, you know, Scientologists, I don't care. But the main thing is that we all sign up in this country to the same values and the same beliefs, you know, in, a, in, in, the, in the broadest sense of, of what we value and what we, what we protect. And we need to know that people are on the same page, and that's of any faith well, or none. That's, that's what bothers me, the fact that um, the, the things that this country finds important, the things that this country has always believed in and followed and everything else mm. is disappearing because because all of a sudden it's all right to have a view where um, you support a terrorist group yeah. and, and the marches are taking place, the police do nothing, they yeah. don't do anything, I'm sorry, yeah. they don't. But I, I just feel that 46% of British Muslims, we have a situation where it, it all comes back to the people that are, oh gosh, here we go, the people that are coming into this country, whether we want them or not, they're coming in. They come with their views and their cultures. And whether we like it or not, it is beginning to have an impact. Yeah. On but again, a lot of these people will be people live. who were born here, but born to the second or third generation, uh, okay. second, second or third generation immigrants. But again, this is something that, again, British public weren't asked. And we would expect that people who arrive here, who obtain British citizenship, or who live here, who are born here, would share a similar... People have different views on lots of different things. Of course, people do, you know, Labour, Tory, whatever, but that share the sort of the fundamental, I suppose, the building blocks of, yeah. of our views. And when people don't, that is an area of concern. Mm. But so I'm, I'm just as concerned by so many people on the far left of other faiths and none who also share those views. We'll have to leave it there, though. I really appreciate your call, Jill. Thank you very much indeed. That's Jill in Cornwall. Do get in touch. Give us a call, 0344 499 1000, if you want to have your say. Coming up after the break, the landmark cash review to be published this Wednesday will say that transgender children face grave psychological consequences for being socially transitioned at school. I'm Julia Hartley-Brewer, and you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Ooh, <we're missing. laughs> there was a suggestion by some 
that maybe it was nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. We're yeah, supposed it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia hartley and You're with Talk TV. Just some breaking news for you from America, one of the biggest dividing lines in American politics being abortion. Donald Trump, uh, as he had uh, said uh, last night that he would do, uh, he's put out a statement on um, abortion and abortion rights uh, today. Uh, and he has just announced that he believes that abortion should be determined by individual U.S. states. This is something, of course, that the Supreme Court uh, said, of course, the Supreme Court that he'd packed with conservative members during his first presidency, possibly might be a second, but he's added he is in favour, how nice of him, for exceptions for women who have suffered from rape, incest, or if it's saving the life of the mother. Now, um, there are some states, um, Sam Armstrong is joining me in the studio today, um, some states in America won't even allow that in those cases, even children raped by their fathers, forced to carry a child to term, um, a, a women whose lives are being taken, well, you can't choose between the woman's life or the baby's life. Well, yeah, you can. Um, it would be the moral thing to do. Um, he's in difficult ground on this, isn't he? Because he gets lots of support from the Christian evangelicals and abortion is a real, it's like guns, a real hard right issue in America. And these people vote on single issues and they're the ones who do a lot of fun funding of political parties as well. Um, however, we also know that the vast majority of Republican voters think that abortion should be a matter between a woman and her doctor and, and be a private issue. So he's walking a tightrope on this one. Yes, that's right. The, the American right spent a long time trying to reverse Roe versus Wade, which said that you had a constitutional right to abortion because they said ordinary states ought to be able to set their own rules. Now, then what's happened is, since that's happened, there's been enormous pressure on these states, in all bar a couple of the exceptions in the very deep south, to actually not necessarily liberalise, but set laws that are yeah. around about 12 weeks, something... But again, something most, there. lots of women don't even know they're pregnant then. Well, that's true. Uh, we should, of course, remember that the UK has got some of the most liberal laws, not just worldwide, but actually in Europe. Uh, they're, they're around roughly similar, the 24-week limit. In, is... the, in the majority of European countries, the limit is set at 12 to 14 weeks. That's that's the, that's the international But the vast average. majority of abortions in this country are around that time. Women find out they're pregnant or, or again, if they find uh, the 12-week scan, they find out there's a, a problem with the, uh, with the baby's health um, or it's not viable. And then this happened. The vast... I mean, we are talking up to the 24 weeks, we are talking, you know, a few hundred, not even thousands, a few hundred in those last few weeks. This is not something that people do lightly. Of women? Course, well, let's go with women, not people. Women do lightly. Yes. People, people with uteruses, Julia. Yeah, people with uh, uteruses, those people, yeah. But again, this is going to be a very big issue, and the Democrats want to make it a big issue as well. I'm, I'm very glad it has not to date been a massive issue in our politics, but we should say, tell you something that is a massive issue in our politics, though, is, is trans. And we know we've seen this at all last week with the absurd new hate crime law in uh, Scotland. But also we've had uh, a report into what happened at the Tavistock Clinic, which were basically the leading uh, clinic. Um, it should be ashamed of itself for transitioning uh, children, uh, even you know, prepubescent children, and putting them on puberty blockers. We've had an interim review by, uh, well, the CAS review uh, in, in uh, last year. Now, the landmark final report by the CAS review is Agenda Identity Services is going to be published on Wednesday. And it's going to say that children, 
children uh, who are supposedly trans face grave psychological consequences if they're allowed to socially transition at school, often without their parents' permission or knowledge. Let's speak to Kevin Lister from the Bad Law Project about this. He himself is a former teacher. Uh, good uh, afternoon to you, Kevin. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for us. Now, this this uh, report, uh, this cast review, uh, was was I mean massively wide ranging, took a very large amount of time, and was really a game changer in terms of uh, exposing what was really going on. The total and utter lack of uh, of evidence for what uh, the trans Tavistock Clinic and other trans clinics were doing, and also the lack of evidence that these puberty blockers and other drugs that children were being put on didn't have massive side effects, weren't actually, uh, you know, very damaging to children and basically exploding an awful lot of the myths we've been told that basically, you know, if you care about kids' health, you'll definitely, you know, you'll basically go along with them thinking they're born in the wrong body and you'll put them on this road. Otherwise, as many parents were told, they might commit suicide. I mean, the horrible blackmail that was delivered. And this cast review really explodes all of that as, frankly, lies. Correct. So, as you say, the first cast review came out. That was a, a big um, step forward in, in bringing some rea um, reality to the situation. And the next review comes out, or the final review comes out on Wednesday. So, obviously, we don't have the review yet, but the, the bits of news that have, that, have, that have been leaked about it suggests it's really starting to move into the right uh, place now. The, the Telegraph reported, um, which I think will be the, 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 uh, the important strap line for the cash review, that um, it talk, is talking about the pipeline from the classroom yeah. to the clinic. And I think that's a really important thing so, that so we need to So basically, a kid them. is confused, they go to their teacher, they, they say, oh, I'm a boy, I think I'm a girl, I'm a girl, I think I'm a boy. They're transitioned socially, so they call them by the, a different name or different gender. And, but instead of that sort of assuaging things and calming things down, the, the cash review, we think, is going to be saying that literally sets you on that railroad track directly towards puberty blockers and everything else. Exactly. And, and the problem is, 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 is it's been systemic. So that situation that you're talking about, where a teacher would normally intervene with a child, with a student of theirs, when there's an issue and say, you know, make sure you understand what you're doing and don't put yourself at harm and so forth. You know, that's normally what, what, what a teacher would do. But with the trans movement, if a teacher does that, they are automatically um, in breach of the Equalities Act. So it can be done for harassment of the, of the, of the student because the student now has got gender protected um, um, uh, uh, rights. So teachers have, have been in a Different, well, in an impossible situation. So you've had teachers in, in an impossible situation, but also you've had teachers and schools who have been encouraging it, literally encouraging it, literally yeah. feeding uh, um, their students yeah. into this medical experiment. And it's, it is an experiment, the likes of which we have never seen ever yeah. in, in, in Western civilization. Indeed, I mean, so with the Tavistock Clinic, and I always say, I live really near it, so I'm really aware, I know people who work there, I remember saying to me a few years ago, you need to get out of this place. You don't want this place on your CV in a few years' time. Trust me, this is all exploding. The number of people who've resigned from that clinic, uh, you know, clinical workers just saying they cannot, they cannot stand by and watch what's happening. But you're talking about confused children, often with autism, often children who've got other mental health problems, children who are suspected of being the victims of abuse, Perhaps largely, they think, particularly with the exposure of the girls, girls who, who think they may be gay, but being gay is unacceptable in their home. So, oh, well, I'll be interesting and I'll be trans. The explosion from a few hundred children a few years ago to 5,000 children now tells you there's something else going on. It's not suddenly that these kids are suddenly waking up and realising that they're trans. A, you know, there's no such thing as a trans kid, and B, to actually sort of to pander to this from children to children is deeply damaging. And, and, and of course, children don't realise that the puberty blockers and all the other things, that that basically affects their body for life. Correct. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's, it's being presented to young people and to vulnerable young people as this panacea that can solve any problem that, that a young child has. You know, if you're upset, if you're anxious, if you're depressed, or whatever else, that's it. You're in the wrong body. Off you go and and uh, and and get on some testosterone. And also, by the way, testosterone is incredibly easily available for not much more than the cost of a young person's pocket money. They can start the yeah. the transition at home. Yeah, it's yeah. The, the whole concept is 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 bizarre. Absolutely bizarre.
Absolutely. It's, it's incredibly worrying. Well, let's, we're going to wait and see this review, but I have to say, I still find it extraordinary that, you know, we've got a ban on the NHS carrying out, uh, giving a lot of these PPT blockers, unless it's for experimentation, well, you know, sort of under studies. Too, frankly, too big a loophole for me, but also parents taking their kids to private clinics, again, under this vet of blackmail, which is what is happening. Thank you so much for joining us, Kevin. I know you guys have done amazing pleasure. work there. Sam Armstrong's still here. It is absolutely astonishing that, that this has happened under our watch. It's happened under Conservative Party watch, and while governments that have been in government, and they did so little about this. And it's not enough just to stop what's going on. It's not enough to draw a line under it either. What needs to happen now is there needs to be proper accountability, a proper investigation into how it was that an activist groups like Stonewall, like Mermaids, yep. like the rest of them, were able to co-opt the National Health Service into conducting experiments on and They are. They were experiments. ..that have shown no efficacy for improving outcomes around mental health and all the rest of it, and have left children mutilated, yeah. have left them filled with hormones with unknown consequences. Infertile and unable to ever have a proper sort of sexual relationship. And I mean, it, it's just, it is absolutely disgusting. With it. And, and the lies that were told to parents as well, it, it is just, it's got to stop. And I'm, I'm still appalled that this government has not just said, this cannot be done, this is a crime, and we will be prosecuting people who do that. And we've got, you know, we've got parents and teachers and, 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 and counsellors and stuff being told, basically, if you don't affirm then these children are going to commit suicide or you are actually effectively uh, trying to, you know, um, stop them transitioning and you're a bad person, whereas actually this is just the people who care most about these children trying to save them from, you know, something they've seen on YouTube. It's, it's the most harrowing thing. I know, and I know I bang on about it, guys, but I bang on about it because it really is happening on a terrible scale. Let's talk about something else, so just very briefly before we go to a break, because we're asking you about that new poll, which says almost half of British Muslims said they sympathise with Hamas. I want to know your reaction, because it's absolutely shocking. Dan says, this is what happens when there's no integration and they push the boundaries. Joe says, well, we could all, they could always go over there and sympathise even better. I do always have that thing, though. People say, oh, go over there. Even if people are born in this country, I always think, you know, like the far left, if you think they're so great, you know, go and live under that country. It's like, go and live in a communist country. Go and live under these... People come to this country because we don't have those kind of rules. That's exactly why. Uh, Steve says, I thought it would be a lot more. I'm more surprised that half don't. Coming up after the break, the UK has failed to prepare itself for war. That's according to the former Armed Forces Minister, James Heapy, and indeed the former Defence Secretary, uh, Ben Wallace. We're going to be talking to another Armed Forces Minister about what we should be doing. I'm Julia Hartley-Brewer, and you're on the Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <it's here. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> that, that oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> 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 Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. 
Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. We're yeah, supposed to have was moved another on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV. Now, it seems strange to say leave such a small, a major topic to such a small slot at the end of the show, but how many times have we discussed this? The UK has failed to prepare itself for war. Who's saying this? Well, not a former general, not a former commander of our forces, not a former defence secretary. This time it's the former armed forces minister, James Heapy, a regular on my old breakfast show. But he has said in an article over the weekend that Britain has moved into a pre-war age following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. He echoes what the uh, defence secretary now now, Grant Shapps has had to say, and indeed what Ben Wallace, when he was Defence Secretary, would say about how we are not in a post-war age, we are in a pre-war age. But why are we not doing anything about it? Well, joining us right now is former Armed Forces Minister with the Conservatives, Lord Robertson. Good afternoon to you, Lord Robertson. Good afternoon. Um, it is extraordinary to have so many senior figures who worked uh, both in the Ministry of Defence, but also, you know, actually, you know, former commanders of our forces and, and you know, chiefs of defence staffs and others saying, we need to start preparing, spending more money, getting our armed forces built up and indeed our, our, you know, our hardware built up. But no one seems to be actually doing it. Why not? Well, I think, you make, uh, Julia, you make a very good, good point. Um, if you wish to avoid war, no. What is it? If you want peace, prepare for war. I think yeah. it's a Greek or a Roman saying from the ancients. Um, unfortunately, uh, anybody under the age of 40, if you start talking about the Cold War, they think you're mad. But until 1990, we had a huge army. We had 55,000 men in the army alone in West Germany, looking east to the Soviets, the Russians, and the Warsaw Pact. But people have forgotten that. Yeah. And we can't Putin even is... fill Wembley Stadium now with our entire know, military but... might. Putin is the, uh, is the old Soviet Union writ large, and it's now not a Cold War, it's a hot war in Ukraine. And I'm afraid if we want to have peace... And if we want to defend ourselves, we have to spend more on defence. And, and this is it. We, more, we are, just... look, we're seeing this among NATO members, finally listening to you know, Donald Trump when he was president the first time round about paying you know, the minimum, bare minimum, 2% yep. of their GDP uh, into defence. And we're seeing other countries like Poland doing far more than that. But it does seem in this country there is just that wake-up call. I don't mean... How many times it's on the front page of the papers? How many senior figures who know what they're talking about say this... Why, well, it's a bit unfortunate. why is the government it's a bit not listening? Is it too expensive? Well, uh, it is expensive, but it's been a bit unfortunate that some of the figure, senior figures that are saying we must have uh, more money spent on defence, the people that were in power, in, in authority until very recently, uh, over the, for instance, the integrated defence review, integrated review, security review, which, which is why we are still cutting our armed force. Now, we must reverse this completely. Uh, and yes, it is too expensive. That's the problem. We spend far too much money on welfare. I'm an old age pensioner. Um, it's far too much money on welfare. Far too much money is wasted in the NHS. Let's these these things need to be dealt with. Yeah. But welfare in particular, I'm afraid we cannot go on spending the money we are spending on old age pensions, like myself, but also on people that could work but don't. Yeah, we need I to. I know a lot of my economy. audience would agree oh. with you on that, but the key thing is, like, know. you know, we know that defence spending is hugely expensive, but even when we do spend money, by the way, we don't seem to get quite as much bang for our buck as some other countries. I think France, France doesn't spend much more than us, and they've got far more than we have in terms of hardware. Um, I, I'm not sure how true that is, to be honest, Julia, but, but I certainly think we have spent money badly in defence, uh, not least because soldiers, sailors, and airmen aren't necessarily the best people to decide what to spend money on. 
Uh, but then nor are civil servants either, and certainly nor are the, uh, defence companies who want to make as much money as possible. But what we must do is we must realise we need to return to a situation where we have strong armed forces, as we did when I was serving 35 years ago. We had huge armed forces. They were well looked after. They were well motivated. And now we, and my son is in the army. Now we have much smaller armed forces. Uh, they are less well motivated because they are not fighting a war, thank God. Yeah. But the way to avoid war is to prepare for it. Yep. And that's what we and, do. And that's the message that is sent out to the dictators like, you know, like the Vladimir Putins, like the Xi Jinping's of China and indeed Iran and elsewhere. Thank you so much for joining us, Lord Robertson. Uh, French, thank you for that. Sam Armstrong is still with us in the studio. Look, it's that old line, you know, you know, speak softly but carry a big stick. The knowledge that the West will act, the knowledge that we are capable and willing to act, two crucial strands there, is what will put off the dictators of the world and the mad mullahs from, from attacking our allies and attacking us. But for some reason, we've just got a bunch of woolly liberal people in power, even in the MOD, who don't seem to get this. Yeah, and here's the thing. What won't help is a belief that the West will fight for a little while and then get bored or get squeamish. We're big at that, aren't we? Like in Ukraine and in Israel, we are making the same mistakes again and again. We turn around and we say, it's outrageous you invaded. It's outrageous you committed this yeah. terrorist atrocity. Six months later... We're told it's too long. It's too yeah. long. Yeah, and that, that is an absolutely crucial fact, isn't it? That we are just not willing to put our sort of money miles away. And again, people say, oh, it's too much, we don't want to go to war. As you, as you say, you, you avoid war by the knowledge on the other side that you are willing and able to go to war and that you will win. And going to war, rather more expensive than not going to war. Sam Armstrong, it's been such a pleasure having all your wonderful common sense on the show. I'm sure my audience feel exactly the same way. Sadly, we have come to the end of the show. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please do join me same time tomorrow. Up next, it's Kevin O'Sullivan and Alex Phillips. Have a great afternoon. I'm Julia Hartley-Brewer and you are with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr.